The same night, Victor returned to the main house and went to Chihuahua's office. With a happy expression, he congratulated him for entering through the main door this time and not like last time when he entered through the window. Chihuahua looked at Vikir and called him deputy consul. He leaned against the wall and put his hand on his forehead. A bit nervous, he asked the secretary a question. Outside the building, there were many people gathered, staring at the window where Vikir was. He asked Chihuahua the reason why so many people were gathered around the building. Chihuahua informed him that the news of deputy consul's return had spread throughout the empire, and he also explained that all those people had come to personally welcome the deputy consul. Vikir, somewhat nervous, put his hand on his head and explained to Chihuahua that he was tired. At that moment, the office door started to slowly open. Pumirian opened the door and entered the office, calling Vikir dad. He approached her and caressed her head, reminding her once again that he was not her father but her uncle. With a pleasant smile, Pomerian nodded and then showed him a white mouse she had in her hands, explaining that its name was Baba. She also explained that she had caught this mouse all by herself. Upon seeing the state of the mouse, Vicar told her that it was a cute dead mouse and advised her to be careful as she could catch the Black Plague. Vicar stood up and then looked at Secretary Chihuahua and asked if the issues of the needy had been resolved. Chihuahua responded that, thanks to his presentation to Sindhu Wendy last time, things were resolved successfully. He also mentioned that she was highly efficient in accomplishing tasks. Chihuahua opened a drawer and somewhat worriedly informed him about a case even Cindy Wendy could not find a clue for, leaving Vicar somewhat shocked. He took out an envelope called F10 and placed it on the table and explained that lately children from the marginalized neighborhoods had been disappearing one after another. According to Chihuahua, it wasn't a case of kidnappings, since the parents of the missing children hadn't been contacted, and the intention behind the abductions was also unknown as it had nothing to do with the black market. He also added that it couldn't have been the work of a monster, as all the children disappeared without leaving a trace. Vicar opened the envelope and began reading the information. While Chihuahua explained that although there was no physical evidence, he believed it was done by a criminal. Chihuahua, noticing that Vicar wasn't responding, reprimanded him, and as he read the reports, he started to become furious. He thought to himself that an incident in which numerous children disappeared in the city of Underdog, he realized that the content was similar to the false accusation against him. So he thought that would happen in the next decades, and quickly realized that this had something to do with what was happening right now. While he was lost in his thoughts, Pomerian caught his attention, he turned around and asked Pomerian not to bother him since he was busy. While she had the live mouse in her arm, she revealed that the mouse had survived, leaving Chihuahua and Vicar speechless. Vicar asked Pomerian if she had brought the mouse back to life. While she looked at the mouse she answered yes. She began to play with the mouse and Vicar put his hand on his chin and thought to himself that this was clearly corpse reanimation, a black magic that could be performed using negative mana. Vicar approached Palmyrian and asked her since when she had learned to do something like this. The mouse climbed onto Palmyrian's head and she began to count her fingers, and she replied that it had been three nights ago. She explained that she had observed what the people of the tribe were doing and started to imitate them. Vicar, somewhat astonished, stared at her and thought that he had discovered Palmyrian in a village of the Lakoko tribe. He began to wonder if it could be that she had learned black magic and necromancy from the Lakoko tribe on her own. The children of the Baskerville and Morgue families, who were said to be home to only geniuses, who barely felt mana until the age of eight. In comparison, Pomerian could use negative mana, which was challenging for a five-year-old child to respond to. She was a magical genius in the blood of the Baskerville family, and also born as a genius of black magic. Vicar began to wonder how Hugo would react to this. He imagined the worst-case scenario where Hugo, upon finding out that she used black magic and that the blood of a barbarian was mixed in, decided that they couldn't let her live. While Vicar was petting Pomerian, he thought it would be obvious to that cold-blooded person, so he decided it was better not to confront him. At that moment, a messenger pigeon began to approach the window of Chihuahua's office. Upon reading the message, he was shocked and quickly informed to Vicar that they were in big trouble. A confused Vicar turned around and asked Chihuahua what was happening. He pointed to the paper where the message was written, and with a trembling voice, revealed that the head of the family was going to come to the main house in person. At that moment, the head of the family slowly got out of his carriage and started moving towards the main house, while Chihuahua was revealing to Vicar that Hugo was going to arrive soon in the city of Underdog. Hugo entered the main house and sat down to talk in front of Vicar, while Chihuahua and Hugo's butler stood behind their chairs, creating tension in the atmosphere. After several minutes, Hugo decided to break the tense atmosphere by asking Vicar if he had returned, to which he responded that he was indeed back. Chihuahua felt relieved to see that someone had finally broken the tension in the atmosphere. Vicar looked to the side and thought to himself that because Hugo had returned, he quickly took Pomerian to the next room and began to pray that nothing would happen. 
Hugo asked Victor how he had been, and he replied that while he was in the deep forest, he lived with the barbarians and focused on recovering from his injuries. He also added that in the process, he pretended to be friendly and identified the barbarians in order to devise a plan to eliminate them. Upon hearing this, Hugo was somewhat surprised and asked for information about Victor's plan. Victor explained that he wanted to use the Empire's industrial products to control the barbarians. He also added that in the Empire, cheap glassware, woolen items, vegetables, and grain were considered valuable to them. So he explained that if he used these, he could effectively control them. Hugo, somewhat confused by Vicar's explanation, responded that this was called trade and not a way to suppress them. Vicar explained that in this process, blood would be shed by the barbarians. With an evil look and aura, Vicar also added that he planned to demand their submission of monsters in exchange for industrial products. Hugo touched his beard and began to think that it was a good idea. He also started wondering if it was possible to expand his territory by shedding the blood of the barbarians. So, with a smile and an evil aura, he thought that it was a wonderful solution since, after all, he was his son. Vicar informed him that he had already built the infrastructure. Upon hearing this, Hugo decided to leave him in charge of the trade with the barbarians. Upon hearing the conversation between Hugo and Vicar, Chihuahua was shocked and started sweating, thinking that this was the conversation of a father and a son who had reunited. Hugo's butler looked and with a tear in his eye, thought that if the patriarch was smiling like this, there must be some reason behind it. He hadn't seen him smile like this in the past two years since the young master Vicar had disappeared. Vicar started to drink some tea and thought to himself that he didn't want the people of Balak to suffer because of the Baskerville family. From the perspective of the Baskerville family, it seemed like the natives were dying as they eliminated the monsters, but in reality, they were only returning to where the madam was. He wanted to avoid a confrontation with Baskerville and buy time to increase Balak's power. Hugo, who was unaware of the existence of the madam, would think that the natives would easily accept this without realizing that their enemy, the forest natives, were increasing their powers. At that moment, Hugo placed his teacup on the table, and Vicar and Chihuahua started staring at him intently. Suddenly, the tea in the cup started heating up to very high temperatures, and Hugo became furious and told Vicar that they were not going to trade with the Lococo tribe. Then, with an angry expression, he told him that he himself was going to annihilate that tribe and asked him to take note of this. The soul of Chihuahua began to escape from his mouth out of fear. Vicar, feeling nervous, responded to Hugo with a yes. Then he started to wonder if Hugo still held a grudge against the Lococo tribe. Thinking about this, he thought that this was another reason why he shouldn't let him meet Pomerian. Hugo put his hand on his head and said aloud that it had been a long time since he had seen his son, but now it seemed that all he had been doing was saying bad things about the barbarians. He asked Vicar not to exceed the front line again, leaving him somewhat surprised. Hugo also explained to him that after saving Morg's daughter and disappearing, they were able to obtain a great diplomatic benefit from the Morgs. Hugo also mentioned that the Imperial family learned about this emotional story, and now they thought highly of the Knights of Baskerville. Despite everything that had happened, for a father who lost his son, everything was meaningless, as getting things in exchange for losing a son had no value. Hugo asked Vicar again to try not to strain himself too much from now on. Upon hearing this, Vicar couldn't help but think of the word pretense, as before returning. The night he escaped after being falsely accused, he felt the sensation of a sword piercing his back. And the cold stares of the bloodhounds, with whom he had shared joys and sorrows, he could instantly realize that he had been abandoned by his own master. His father didn't even give him the chance to explain, causing his fangs to not become dull from his pretense. Vicar, with a murderous look, thanked his father Hugo Le Baskerville for having been concerned about him. At that moment, Pomerian entered the room and started calling Vicar uncle, causing him and Chihuahua to start feeling the danger of the situation. She entered the room running and circled Hugo's couch to reach Vicar's couch, explaining to him that she was very afraid of the thunder. She quickly made her way to Vicar's couch and embraced him, tears streaming down her face. Chihuahua approached her and asked her that now was not the time. Vicar panicked and thought he couldn't let Pomerian and Hugo meet. In that moment, Hugo glanced at Pomerian's eyes. Then, furious, he stood up from the couch, creating tension in the room. But upon seeing Pomerian's face, he couldn't help but be struck and saddened at the same time, since her face was quite familiar to him. The swordsman with the iron blood, the owner of Baskerville, one of the seven families of the Great Empire. Hugo Le Baskerville, the best swordsman in the Empire who expelled the barbarians far beyond the borders and also exterminated hundreds of monsters. Once Hugo decided on a direction, he never looked back. He was truly known as a man with iron blood. But now Hugo's feelings began to tremble as he saw the little girl in front of him. Hugo was speechless when he saw Pomerian's face. Pomerian hugged Vicar with all her strength and tearfully told him that she was very scared, leaving Vicar both shocked and confused at the same time. Tears streaming down her face, Pomerian looked at Hugo again, 
then started crying once more and told Victor that she was very scared of that man's mustache, leaving Chihuahua speechless. Upon seeing the situation, Victor quickly intervened and asked his father to calm down. Nervously, he also explained to Hugo that she was a little girl he had personally brought for an errand. He also explained that initially when he saw her red eyes, he thought they were a family trait, but later after investigating, he found out that she was from a border tribe. Vicar also told him that there was no chance she was someone known to their family, leaving Hugo speechless. Hugo quickly calmed down, and then put his hand on his head and thought that he had made a mistake, since if Penelope were still alive, she couldn't be the same age as the little girl. Hugo stood up and started heading towards the exit, deciding to go back home as he was quite tired. At that moment, Victor looked at him intently and somewhat nervously asked him to be careful. He thought to himself how Hugo, a person with the soul of a sword master, was so surprised to see Pomerian, so Victor quickly came to the conclusion that there was definitely something there. Hugo turned around and asked Victor to attend the grand banquet tomorrow. Upon hearing Hugo's words, Chihuahua was confused and thought to himself that the grand banquet was a dinner where only a very small number of immediate family members gathered. He also thought that the dream of every lower Baskerville was to attend the banquet. Vicar said goodbye to Hugo, telling him that they would see each other tomorrow. Just before leaving through the door, Hugo looked at Pomerian once again, who was in Chihuahua's scared arms. That same night, Vicar placed some pillows on his bed and covered them with sheets while he lay down on the floor next to the bed. With an empty stare, Vicar thought that after washing himself with hot water and lying on the soft bed, he felt uncomfortable and couldn't sleep. He started to wonder if this was due to the influence of the two years he had spent with the Balak warriors. He also thought that the influence of the warriors would be ingrained in him for some time. He thought that Hugo's reaction had been quite unexpected. Based on his previous reaction to the incident with Pomerian and the amulet, he had to make a decision. After the grand feast tomorrow, he planned to hint to Hugo that Pomerian might prove to be a good card for him to strike a decisive blow. Either way, he had to do it in a way that wouldn't harm Pomerian. Vicar closed his eyes to sleep, but at that moment, the curtain in his room moved. Vicar quickly realized that something was wrong. His senses did not fail him as a hooded woman entered his room. The woman slowly unsheathed her knife and approached Vicar's bed. At that moment, a voice told the woman that less than a day had passed since he had returned, but news traveled fast. Vicar placed one of his hands on the bed and, using the momentum, delivered a powerful kick to the hooded woman. The woman managed to dodge the kick at the last second, but in the process, she dropped her knife, which flew and embedded itself in the wall. In the blink of an eye, Vicar placed his hand under the hooded woman's throat, but at that moment, the woman quickly asked him to wait a minute. She began to tell him that it was just a joke. Upon hearing the woman's voice, Vicar immediately recognized her. Vicar moved closer to the woman's face and asked her to request a formal meeting from now on, as he could have accidentally killed her. The woman replied that sleeping on the floor disguised as a pillow was a strange sleeping habit. The woman slowly started to remove her mask and told Vicar that even if he died and came back to life, nothing had changed about him. After removing the mask, the woman greeted him, and Vicar looked at her and asked her not to cause a scene by calling her by her name, Cindy Wendy. She began to approach the bed and asked Vicar if he had sent her to Chihuahua, and she also asked him how he had known that she was going with the girl who received 10 billion. Vicar began to put on his shirt and replied that trust was generated by increasing wealth, he also added that he had taken note of her behavior pattern in order to eventually ignore it all. Sindhuendi sat on the bed and told him that robbing him was rude, she also explained that as a financial planner, the only thing she did was receive unemployment bonuses. She also explained that if it weren't for her, all the 10 billion that Judy received would have been wasted. Vicar denied her words by telling her that bodyguards had been added to prevent that. Sindhuendi, somewhat confused, asked Vicar if there was no way the bodyguards could do something like that. Vicar revealed to her that financial experts had also been assigned among the bodyguards, he himself had given orders to filter various traitors. Sindhu Wendy, somewhat surprised, asked if he was referring to those bodyguards. Vicar looked her in the eyes and reminded her that he himself had ordered her to let them get close. She immediately realized that Vicar had been with playing her from beginning to end. As Vicar was fixing his hair, he asked Sindhu Wendy what information he had requested. She reached into her suit and pulled out envelopes with information and handed them to Vicar. Seeing this, he thought that her personality hadn't changed much in the past two years. He asked Sindhu Wendy to place it in the file next time and send it instead of hiding it in her suit. In exchange for this information, Vicar decided to fulfill his promise to build a bridge for trade with the natives. Sindhu Wendy replied that from now on she would have to call him boss. As Vicar looked at the envelopes, he thought to himself that these envelopes contained information about the people who would attend the banquet tomorrow. He also thought that since he had made a contribution, he hoped to be invited to the banquet. According to the information in the envelopes, the people who were going to attend the banquet were Hugo Labaskerville, holding the patriarch rank, with the status of Marquis, 
with the military prestige of Swordmaster. Upon seeing Hugo's envelope, Vicar thought that there was no need to check the information about him, but upon opening the following envelopes, he was shocked and asked Sinduendi if these people were also going to attend. The envelopes contained information about Boston Terrier Labaskerville, with the rank of captain of the Pitbull Knights, Senator. With the status of Count, the highest ranked military prestige according to the information, he was Hugo Labaskerville's half-brother. He also hated being tied to any place and had a very aggressive and unruly personality. The other envelope contained information about Great Dane Labaskerville, a captain of the Mastiff Knights and a senator. With the status of Count, the highest ranked military prestige, he was Hugo Labaskerville's half-brother. He didn't get along with anyone, but had a particularly bad relationship with the Count, Boston Terrier. Vicar became somewhat confused upon seeing this since these people usually didn't attend family events. He asked Sinduendi what was going on. Sinduendi replied that they were coming to see the young Baskerville legend who had returned alive. She also assumed they would come to take Vicar to their nightly orders. Vicar started looking at the other envelopes and told her he was sure he would be quite tired tomorrow. Among the envelopes, he saw one that contained information about Osiris Labaskerville, a representative with the status of Viscount and the highest ranked military prestige. He was Hugo Labaskerville's eldest son and was currently the first heir of the family. Upon seeing this, Vicar asked Sinduendi if Osiris was also going to attend. She explained that Osiris was the eldest son of the Baskerville family. Growing and replicating Hugo's past, his sword skills were already on par with the Seven Counts, and it was estimated that he would soon reach the level of Swordmaster. Vicar thought that before returning, he had seen Osiris several times from afar. He was a quiet and cold person who didn't even greet his subordinates or his younger siblings in the direct lineage. Sinduendi asked Vicar if, excluding the Patriarch and the Seven Counts, Osiris would be the strongest of the Baskervilles. She began to wonder if Vicar was stronger than Osiris. Vicar advised her not to try to guess his fighting power at a glance. Among the information in the envelopes, he saw information about a person who he had heard was receiving training in a closed facility. He started wondering if this person would briefly come out to attend the banquet. This person was Set Labaskerville, a consul of the underdog city and a member of the Chamber of Representatives. He held the status of Viscount and had an intermediate level military prestige. He was Hugo Labaskerville's second son and was currently the second heir of the family. His talent for sword handling was far behind his elder brothers, and he had been particularly sickly from a young age. His personality was not typical of a Baskerville, as he was gentle and kind. When he was young, Hugo would chase him for being weak. He was the only one who shed tears for the hounds that died like trash, he was the only respectable person in Baskerville. Vicar thought there must be a reason why he had to meet him. After reviewing all the envelopes, Vicar forcefully left them on the table and told Sinduendi that these were unexpected names. Sinduendi, somewhat confused and angry, explained that she had done a lot of research and also asked why he had rushed to look at them. Vicar simply replied that he knew them better than anyone else. He thought to himself that there would be a great feast tomorrow. He started staring at the envelopes and with a smile, he told Sinduendi that many fun things were going to happen tomorrow. The next day, Vicar began to make his way towards the Grand Banquet Hall. After several minutes, he arrived at the door of the Grand Banquet Hall, which was guarded by two guards who were creating tension in the atmosphere. Vicar started to approach the door and stared at it intently. After several seconds, he began to slowly open the door, further increasing the tension in the room. Upon opening the door, a bright light dazzled his face. Once the intensity of the light subsided, he saw Hugo sitting on the seat of honor. Beside him was his butler. On Hugo's left side sat his children and on his right side sat his brothers. The butler informed everyone that Vicar Van Baskerville was also going to attend the grand banquet as ordered by the head of the family. Everyone turned towards the direction where Vicar was, first set Labaskerville turned, who had dark circles under his eyes and looked quite tired, but despite this, he smiled at him pleasantly. Then Osiris turned, who simply looked at Vicar with one eye, then Highborough, Middleborough and Lowborough turned, who started looking at him with admiration. Then the Great Dane turned around, who was somewhat surprised to see Vicar attending the grand banquet, and finally Boston Terrier turned around, and while resting his head on his fist simply smiled at seeing Vicar. Vicar placed a hand on his chest and closed his eyes to thank Hugo for the invitation to the grand banquet. Hugo stared at him intently and while his eyes were shining, he called Vicar, son, and asked him to come to the table and sit next to his brothers. He approached and sat at the table, and the grand banquet began. First, everyone started with the main course, which was meat. They all started eating without saying a word, creating tension in the atmosphere. The servants stood behind Boston Terrier's chair and watched as the tension in the room began to increase every second. The first person to break the tension was Boston Terrier Labaskerville, commander of the Pitbull Order. His plate had four pieces of sliced meat, 
He asked everyone if the meat was undercooked. Hugo became somewhat confused, looked at Boston Terrier, and asked him if he didn't like meat. Boston Terrier smiled and replied that it wasn't what he had meant to say. He then pointed with his hand to the person sitting next to him, who was struggling to cut the meat as it was quite raw. Boston Terrier explained to Hugo that he was referring to the meat on the plate next to him. The person sitting next to him was Great Dane LeBaskerville, commander of the Mastiff Order, who was a bit annoyed. He asked Boston Terrier what else he was dissatisfied with. Boston Terrier stared at him and replied that he had never thought he would eat raw meat. He also added that it was as if he was trying to eat his adorable nephew raw. Great Dane also stared at him and admitted that Vicar seemed cute, but reminded him that he too was his nephew, and as an uncle, it was natural to guide his nephew on the right path. Boston Terrier pointed his finger at Vicar and asked Great Dane why the right path involved throwing a child to a mastiff. Great Dane replied that this path was much better than getting involved with a stupid and boring pit bull. While Vicar looked at his uncles, he thought to himself that as expected, they had come with the intention of recruiting him. Among the seven knights representing Baskerville, two of them wanted to recruit him for the Pitbull and Mastiff Knights. Before regressing, Vicar would have liked it since they were the elite with guaranteed success. While he was taking a piece of meat to his mouth, he looked at his uncles disdainfully and thought that now they simply seemed like a bunch of stray dogs. Hugo interrupted the conversation between Great Dane and Boston Terrier, then while the butler was pouring him some wine in a glass, he explained to them that the younger brothers were always noble and arrogant, and he also added that the head of the house was happy to see them showing affection for the young master. While Vicar was watching his father drink from the glass of wine, he thought that the chief steward always gave a hopeful interpretation, and he also thought that Hugo enjoyed watching his younger brothers fight. Boston Terrier caught his attention and addressed him as his dear nephew to ask if he had spent the last two years in La Rouge at Lenoir Mountains. He also asked how many barbarians and monsters he had killed. He asked him to share his forest experiences with him. Great Dane also caught Vicar's attention to tell him that he was also concerned about knowing how his nephew had spent that time in the dangerous forest, and he also added that he was curious about his growth in the forest. Hugo interrupted the conversation and asked his brothers not to pressure him and asked them to let him eat. Great Dane asked Hugo if he felt curious, and Boston Terrier explained that he couldn't resist curiosity, so he hurried back as soon as possible to attend the grand banquet. At that moment, Hugo got angry and asked both of them that it was enough already. Upon hearing this, Great Dane and Boston Terrier felt the immense pressure coming from their older brother's words. Hugo stood up from his chair with a killer aura, and while holding a piece of meat with his fork, he reminded them again that he didn't like to say things twice. Both calmed down and decided to stop talking anymore. But at that moment, Vicar also stood up from his chair and while looking at his two uncles, he explained to everyone that it wasn't difficult to prove his achievements. Upon seeing that Vicar had gotten up, Hugo looked at him and reminded him that he had traveled a long distance. He asked if it wouldn't be exhausting to make it all the way to the drill hall. Vicar looked at Hugo and replied that it was fine. Then, he extended his hand and touched the table, explaining to everyone that he could showcase his skills anytime and anywhere. He also asked them if everyday life wasn't an extension of training. He caught the attention of his uncle Boston Terrier and revealed that there was too much wine in his glass. Then, he caught the attention of his uncle Great Dane and disclosed that his steak was not well done, leaving both surprised and somewhat confused. While he was touching the table, he began to concentrate, and after several seconds, his finger started to release a bit of his mana. Vicar directed that mana towards the wine glass and the steak plate, causing the steak to cook perfectly and making sure the wine glass had the perfect amount of wine. Great Dane pierced the meat with his fork and was impressed to see that it was cooked perfectly. Boston Terrier took the wine glass and upon seeing that it had the perfect amount of wine, started laughing. Boston Terrier explained to everyone that when Vicar placed his hand on the table, he had used mana to cook the meat and heat the wine. He was surprised to see that he had reached the intermediate level of graduation at 17 years old, when normally one would reach that stage at 33 years old. He also shared his thoughts that his older brother Hugo must feel proud to have a son who had mastered all these techniques. Hugo simply drank from his wine glass and listened to the praises of his younger brother towards his son. Vicar looked towards Highborough, Middleborough, and Lowborough and thought that this was very strange because two years ago, he thought he had revealed his abilities as a mid-ranker graduate when he fought against Madame. He never thought that anyone would know until now. He looked at the three boys who were looking at him with admiration and thought they must know about his abilities. He also started to wonder why they didn't inform anyone. At that moment, someone caught his attention by calling him little brother to praise him for working very hard. The person who had praised him was Osiris LeBaskerville, first in line for succession, and the Baskerville family's eldest son. 
While holding his wine glass, he once again praised Vikir for doing a good job and also asked him to continue working harder in the future. Vikir, somewhat confused, thanked his older brother and began to wonder if Osiris had just praised him. Osiris was the first successor in line for the current Baskerville family and also resembled Hugo the most. Vicar still couldn't believe that Osiris was praising him. He started wondering if he was being evaluated by him. Then another person who had just placed his wine glass on the table, told everyone that it was surprising to see the older brother praising his younger brother. This person was Set Le Baskerville, second in line for succession, and the Baskerville family's second oldest son. He looked at Vicar and revealed to everyone that this was the first time he had seen older brother Osiris praise someone with such a bright and joyful smile. He also told Vicar that he had a poker face just like his brother Osiris, and asked if by any chance he knew his older brothers. Vicar looked at him somewhat confused and replied that he was very aware of who his brothers were. Set looked at him, and with a joyful smile, he was glad that his younger brother knew him. He then explained that because he was very weak, he always stayed in the medical wing or at the isolation training hall. He also added that his training hall was very close to underdog where Vicar was deputy consul. He planned to pay him a visit, so he asked if he could share his experience of the deep forest. Vicar, with a lost gaze, looked towards nothingness and thought that his bright attitude, which was very different from being a Baskerville, had not changed. During the fall, Vicar had the opportunity to serve under Set, so there were moments when they were together. In the midst of the chaos of battle, he was the only one who comforted the fallen bloodhounds. He even comforted Vicar, who was soaked in blood wandering through the battlefield. Even when Vicar was falsely accused, he remained by his side defending him until the end. With a cheerful smile, Set told Vicar that he would be under his care. Set was the only person Vicar wanted to meet at this banquet. At that moment, Vicar's expression changed drastically as he began to smell a disgusting stench that had been lingering since before. This repugnant odor was something only he could sense, as it had been present during the fall. This repugnant odor was the smell of demon. He quickly realized there was a hidden demon among the people present at the grand banquet. Vicar looked at everyone and started wondering where the source of this disgusting stench was. He closed his eyes, and after several seconds he opened them again and stared at a person. This person was holding his wine glass, he was set, who had demon hands covering his body. He stared intently and with a smile asked Vicar, is there something you need? Vicar and Set began to converse, and while they were conversing, he realized that Set was constantly engaging in conversation with everyone to lighten the mood and appear natural. While a maid was pouring some wine into Set's glass, he started asking her how she was doing. Upon seeing this, Vicar was somewhat surprised because Set wasn't just maintaining constant conversation with his siblings but also with the servants. He stared at him intently with one eye and thought that he was the same person he had met before regressing. He also began to wonder why the person he had trusted the most smelled like demons. While Set was holding his glass with one hand, he looked at Vicar and explained that when he was absent, he had heard that he had taken on the role of deputy consul of Underdog City. He also added that he had even heard that the citizens appreciated him so much that they started protesting for him to assume the position permanently. Set also told him that he was eager to work with him when he returned to his position as deputy consul. Vicar stared into Set's eyes and simply remained silent. Then while holding the wine glass with three fingers, he began to bring his wine glass closer to Set's for a toast. Set looked at Vicar's wine glass with a smile, then Vicar told him that he was also very eager to work with him. Upon hearing this, Set was delighted and they both clinked their wine glasses together in a toast, and he told him that he would be under his care. After toasting, Vicar began to bring his wine glass closer to his eye, creating a slight tension in the atmosphere. He started staring at the reflection of the wine glass, and while doing so, he saw Osiris sitting in his armchair. However, when he looked at Set's chair, he saw that it was empty. Immediately, he realized that he was unable to see his reflection in the wine glass. Upon seeing this, he began to wonder if Set was dead and a demon was possessing his lifeless body. Vicar looked at everyone present at the table and started questioning himself whether he should reveal to them all that Set was a demon. At the same time, while Set was enjoying his wine, Vicar began bringing his own glass of wine closer to his mouth and stared fixedly at Set. He changed his thoughts and decided not to reveal to anyone at the table that Set was a demon, since he thought that if he did, then his father and the others would ask him for proper evidence. Immediately, he decided that first he needed to wait for the grand banquet to finish, in order to gather evidence to accuse Set of being a demon. With a pleasant smile, Set asked Vicar which order he was going to join. Smelling the odor coming from Set's breath, Vicar thought it was suffocating. Set closed his eyes and with a smile, he explained that when he was young, he thought the Doberman Order's uniform was cool. At that moment, Osiris, upon seeing Set chatting, interrupted their conversation and told Set that they hadn't finished eating yet. 
Then, with a piercing look, he asked him to stop bothering his brother with his insignificant talk and finish his dinner. After saying these words, Osiris began to clean up the remnants of the food with the tablecloth, and upon hearing his words, Set became somewhat nervous and decided not to continue speaking in order not to anger him. Vikir also looked at Osiris and thought to himself that now thanks to him, he was free from the smell coming from Set's breath. Hugo caught Vicar's attention and asked how the food was. He looked at Hugo and replied that it was very good. Upon hearing this, Hugo told him that he was very happy that he was enjoying the food. He then added that he had a matter to discuss with him and now that they were in the main house, he asked Vicar to visit his office. Vicar looked at Hugo and pondered for several seconds before responding that he understood. That same night, after finishing the grand banquet dinner, he left the main house. While walking away from the house, he sighed as he was a bit tired since the dinner had lasted five hours. This experience was tough for him as he never thought he would dine with those people. During dinner, he heard that the official document for the participants of the academy had arrived in Baskerville. He didn't take long to realize that the reason Hugo had summoned him was because of his enrollment in the academy. While he was lost in his thoughts, a man who was on top of the main house started staring at him. The man took advantage of Vicar's guard being down to launch a powerful sword attack, causing a red aura to quickly advance towards him. But to his surprise, Vicar immediately felt the presence of the attack, and as he looked in the direction of the attack, he realized it was the sixth technique of the Baskerville family. Realizing this, he began to wonder if he would be able to surpass it. While he was unsheathing his sword, he remembered that his revealed skill level was mid-grade graduator, which meant that he couldn't go beyond that. So without further ado, he used the fourth Baskerville technique and unleashed precise and powerful sword cuts towards the attack. The cuts started weakening the attack, upon seeing this, he planned to absorb the remaining aura with the blessing of the river Styx and his own aura. He prepared himself to absorb the aura, but to his surprise, just before the attack could impact him, it simply disappeared. Upon seeing this, he became somewhat confused and started looking towards the roof of the main house where he saw the leg of the man who had launched the attack at him. The man began to laugh out loud. This man was none other than Boston Terrier Le Baskerville himself. With a smile on his face, he explained to Vicar that there was a two-level difference between their techniques. Despite this, he was quite surprised to see that he had withstood his attack. Boston Terrier praised Vicar for being a true adult, then jumped down from the roof of the main house to the ground. Due to the impact, he created cracks in the floor. He said out loud that he knew his eye wasn't deceiving him and asked Dane if he thought the same way. Dane appeared behind Vicar and, upon seeing that Boston Terrier had swung his sword in the main house, told him that these behaviors were those of a barbarian. Dane stared at Boston Terrier and asked why he had tried to kill his beloved nephew. He also added that if Hugo found out about this, as punishment, at the very least he would be sentenced to several months of probation. Boston Terrier looked at Dane and with a smile, asked him how he could say these kinds of things about the love an uncle has for his nephew. He also revealed that he had adjusted the attack to disappear right before him, so he wouldn't get hurt. He also asked Dane why he didn't follow his own path and stop interfering with them, the Pitbulls. Upon hearing this, Dane corrected him by saying that Vicar belonged to the Mastiffs. He also added that as his uncle, he would not allow his beloved nephew to join a gang of thugs. While the two of them were arguing, Vicar began to sheathe his sword, and meanwhile things between Dane and Boston Terrier started to heat up. Boston Terrier mocked Dane by telling him that someone who begged to be saved when he got a small cut on his belly shouldn't say these things. Dane retaliated against Boston Terrier by telling him that pit bulls were so muscular that they didn't have belly skin to tear. Both drew their swords and Boston Terrier proposed to have a duel, and the winner would take Vicar to his order. Dane accepted without hesitation since he always wanted the best for his nephew. Seeing that both were about to fight, Vicar simply turned around and started walking away from them, thinking that his uncles were quite annoying. As he was walking away, he thought to himself that the previous attack Boston Terrier had launched at him hadn't been so strong. While he was advancing towards the bridge that connected the main house with Underdog City, he thought that the strongest attack from the seven counts was the sixth technique of the highest ranking Baskerville grader. He himself was also the highest ranking grader, but still knew about the seventh technique, and furthermore knew how to use the blessing of Styx River and the demonic sword Beelzebub. With a smile and a murderous look, he thought that thanks to these techniques, he could now go against two of the counts. After crossing the bridge, Vicar saw three people standing in front of him and upon seeing this, he became somewhat confused. The people in front of him were High Burrow, Middle Burrow, and Low Burrow, who began to stare at him intently, creating tension in the air. Several seconds later, slowly but surely all three started unsheathing their swords. Upon seeing this, Vicar realized that this was not good. With his eyes gleaming, he began to glare aggressively at them and grew angry at the thought that they already knew the difference between their powers. And now, upon seeing that they were willing to fight despite knowing the difference in power between them and him, he thought he had no other choice but to kill the bloodhounds who showed their teeth without knowing their place. 
but to his surprise, instead of trying to fight, High Burrow, Middle Burrow, and Low Burrow kneeled down, lowered their heads, and placed their swords at their feet, leaving him astonished. He looked at High Burrow and as he glanced down at his feet, he realized that they were making the promise. The promise was a position that made the knights vulnerable, in this position one single push and their sword would penetrate through their feet. If a knight adopted this position, it meant that he was putting his life in the hands of the person standing before him. Vicar asked High Burrow, Middle Burrow, and Low Burrow what they were doing. The three stared at him and replied that they had come to pay off their debts. High Burrow explained to him that the feeling he had since he was attacked by him when he was nine years old was fear. Middle Burrow told him that he had started to recognize him when he had hunted Cerberus, and finally Low Burrow told him that he was amazed to see that he had been able to kill the troll. The three of them explained to him that they had started to feel a sense of admiration and reverence after seeing that he had been able to confront the giant monster in the forest. They also added that on the day they barely escaped with their lives, they gathered and decided that from now on they would become the three spears of Vicar Van Baskerville. They asked him to please become their master whom they, the bloodhounds, will serve forever. Upon hearing this, Vicar was somewhat surprised. He thought that before regressing, they were the ones who captured him and also the ones who fled after he was falsely accused. They three were called Hugo's Three Spears, and Vicar knew that they were simply bloodhounds carrying out their orders. But despite this, just because they were following orders didn't make Vicar's feelings disappear. He simply walked past the three without saying a word, and upon seeing this, High Burrow, Middle Burrow, and Low Burrow became sad. But to everyone's surprise, as he was walking away, he told them that he didn't need things like promises, and added that he was tired now, so they would talk about this later. Deep down, Vicar hadn't forgiven them, but wanted to use them at his mercy to carry out his revenge plan. With a smile, the three of them looked at Vicar and he asked them not to reveal to anyone the fact that they were now together and what would happen in the future. While he was walking away from them, the three of them responded to him that they understood. After hearing this, he simply kept walking without saying a word. He thought to himself that Set's body being taken over by demons was a variable he hadn't expected, so he thought he needed to ask Sinduendi to investigate this matter as quickly as possible because no matter what happened, he needed to kill the demon. He began staring at Hugo's office in front of him and thought that before killing the demon, he needed to do something even more important. He went to Hugo's office, and upon entering, he said a few words that made him furious. Hugo asked what he had just said, creating such tension in the atmosphere that even the butler began to feel afraid. Hugo asked Vicar to repeat what he had just said. With a calm voice and a tranquil gaze, Vicar took a step forward and spoke again about Roxana, his deceased first wife, and the daughter between him and Roxana, Penelope. Vicar stared at Hugo and asked him if he could talk to him about Penelope. Upon hearing this, Hugo became furious and with a deadly look and aura, he asked how he knew the name of Penelope. Vicar simply looked into his eyes, and while his eyes were shining, he thought that this was only the beginning of his revenge plan. A few hours ago, when dawn broke and the sun's rays began to penetrate the windows of the house. In Hugo's office, he took out an envelope and placed it on the table, explaining to Vicar that they had received a notice from the academy. Vicar took the envelope with both hands and while reading the notice, Hugo intertwined his fingers. As he watched his son read the notice, he decided to talk to him about the previous promise he had made regarding entering the academy. The notice letter was from Colosseo and it was a letter specifically addressed to the students of class 20. While Vicar was reading the notice letter, he thought that he had guessed right when he thought that the reason Hugo had summoned him was because of his admission to the academy. Colosseo Academy was the largest educational institution that the Great Rock Empire provided for students. If a student managed to graduate from the academy, then they would start the elite course at the Imperial Palace or even on an upper floor. Before regressing, Vicar attended the academy as a servant for the triplets, and back then, he had numerous scars on his face and limp, so he was disregarded by the nobles of the academy. Now that he had regressed, the bad memories of the academy didn't bother him at all. While Vicar was lost in his thoughts, Hugo caught his attention and with a smile asked him if the triplets, whom he himself had asked to go with him, would be okay. He also asked if besides them, there was anyone else that he would like to take with him to the academy. Vicar looked at Hugo and asked him that before answering his questions, he would also like to ask him something. He explained to him that two years ago, due to his disappearance, the head of the family received a letter indicating that he would receive a great benefit from the Mork family, and Vicar himself would be rewarded. He asked his father if it was true that he was going to receive a reward. With a smile, Hugo replied that it was correct and also asked if there was something specific he wanted as a reward. Vicar replied that as a reward he wanted his father to share a story with him. Hugo was somewhat confused to see that he wanted to hear a simple story as a reward. As he felt very curious, he asked him what kind of story he wanted to hear. Now that Hugo had agreed to give him a story as a reward, Vicar told him that he would assume that he had allowed him to ask. 
He approached Hugo's table and revealed that he would like to know about Mrs. Roxana and Miss Penelope. Upon hearing these two names, the butler's expression changed drastically as he couldn't believe what Vicar had just asked him. Hugo's expression also changed and he asked Vicar what he had just said. Vicar started staring into his eyes and mentioned again the late Mrs. Roxana, his first wife, and the daughter they had together. Vicar asked Hugo once again if he could talk to him about Miss Penelope. Upon hearing the name Penelope, Hugo clenched both fists and began to get angry, asking Vicar how he knew Penelope's name. With a killer look, Hugo also asked him why he was asking this, and he added that if he was asking out of mere curiosity, he advised him that it would be better if he didn't. Despite the enormous pressure created by Hugo in the atmosphere, Vicar simply closed his eyes and placed his hand on his chest. With a calm voice, he replied that first he needed to know his answer in order to tell him the reason why he needed to hear the story. Upon hearing this, Hugo began to get angrier and angrier. And just before his anger exploded, Vicar explained to him that the reason was not mere curiosity, and also asked him to please trust him. Hugo's thoughts about his first wife, whom he met through an arranged marriage, and his eldest daughter who was kidnapped by barbarians. It was all crucial information that Vicar needed to reveal Pomerian's existence to Hugo. While Vicar was heading to Hugo's office with Barrymore the butler, he told him a fairy tale that was very hard to believe. On the way to Hugo's office, Barrymore told him that he might not believe his words, but the patriarch was an affectionate man towards his family. Upon hearing this, Vicar was somewhat surprised and replied that he didn't think there were many Baskervilles who believed in Hugo. Barrymore told him that the patriarch still loved his first wife, Mrs. Roxana, very much, who had passed away due to an illness. Despite hearing the story Barrymore had told him, Vicar still couldn't allow Hugo to meet Pomerian based solely on Barrymore's fairy tale. He needed to verify it for himself. Hugo remained silent for several minutes, creating tension in the air, and then decided to speak up. He placed his hand on his chest and with a sad expression, he told Vicar that Roxana was his only love, whom he loved with all his heart, and Penelope was his most precious treasure. Upon hearing Hugo's words, Vicar was somewhat surprised and confused at the same time. He began to wonder if the word love had just come out of his father's mouth. Hugo rested his elbows on the table and intertwined his hands. While looking at the floor, he was honest with him and revealed that he and Roxana were not in an arranged marriage since she was a commoner who had nothing. Despite many years having passed, Hugo still remembered the day they met as if it were yesterday. While both were walking through the city, they looked at each other and fell in love at first sight. Upon hearing this, Vicar looked at Hugo and realized that he was starting from the first time he met Roxana. Hugo explained to him that the love between them was very difficult, as Roxana tried to distance herself from him because of her humble origin, but he gave up everything and went with her. If it were up to her, Hugo was willing to get rid of everything, not only his physical body but also his own soul. Vicar had not come to listen to this story, so he thanked his father for sharing the story with him and asked if he could advance a little further in the story until Penelope appeared. Just before Vicar could finish speaking, Hugo interrupted him to continue telling the story. He explained that their love was once again put to the test, since they were being chased by the Baskerville family, who wanted to capture them. In order to protect Roxana, Hugo fought for his life, and the thorny path they both traveled was one in which no one blessed their love. Many times they thought about giving up, but they were able to stay together thanks to their mutual love. And despite that being the beginning of a difficult start, both managed to overcome their parents' disagreement and got married. Upon hearing this love story, Barrymore became emotional and took off his glasses to wipe away the tears. Through their relationship, Penelope was born, his beloved wife and dear daughter. They were people he wanted to protect since he had obtained them through struggle. But unfortunately, after giving birth, Roxana's health deteriorated instantly. In the end, she couldn't fight the illness anymore and she left this world, leaving behind a young Penelope. Fortunately, she grew up to be a bright and charming girl. She inherited her father's strong mentality and her mother's loving heart. She received love from all the Baskervilles. Despite having lost his wife, Hugo was happy just knowing that Penelope was well. He was happy until that incident happened. When he remembered this event again, Hugo unconsciously let out his killer mana and grabbed the arm of the armchair so tightly that it started to break into pieces. Hugo explained that Penelope, who went out for a walk, was captured by the Lococo tribe. He began to get even angrier and with a murderous look wondered how the barbarians had managed to enter Baskerville territory and how they had managed to kidnap Penelope, which was a fact that until today Hugo was unable to decipher. And because of this, up until now, he couldn't find any clues about Penelope. While Vicar was staring at Hugo, he simply listened to his words without interrupting him. Hugo used Penelope's disappearance as justification to expand the Empire's region and started searching for his daughter by subjugating the barbarians. 
He felt that doing it alone was going to be difficult, so he drastically increased the number of his wives through arranged marriages and began producing offspring en masse. And decades later, although stationed on the border, Hugo created a powerful family that no one could look down upon, and thus the Iron Blood Baskerville family was born. Hugo put his hand on his head and began to lament the loss of his daughter and wife. And upon seeing this, Vicar thought that despite showing coldness to restore the family and for the glory of the empire, behind that, he was hurt by having lost the family he loved so much. Despite seeing Hugo's true face, Vicar thought it meant nothing since all villains had a past story, and the evil acts they committed throughout life were all that remained. While Vicar was looking at Hugo with contempt, he thought that he was only a soulless human who mass-produced offspring and sent them to the battlefield. Despite thinking this way, Vicar still understood how precious Roxana and Penelope were to him. Hugo finished telling the story, and while staring intensely at Vicar, with a look and a killer aura that was creating tension in the atmosphere, he told him that he had already finished telling the little story, and also asked him to now tell him the reason why he had asked about them. Vicar put his hand in his pocket and took out a golden pendant. He approached Hugo's table and placed the pendant on it, asking if he could take a look at it. Hugo started to examine the pendant and realized that it was familiar to him. As he held it in his hand and looked closely, he realized that it was the pendant he made for his wife Roxana, and it was the same pendant that Penelope was wearing before being kidnapped by the barbarians. Upon opening the locket, Hugo saw a photo of himself, Roxana, and their daughter Penelope. Upon seeing this, he began to stare at it intently, creating even more tension in the atmosphere. Vicar started to move away from Hugo's table and asked him what he would do if Miss Penelope's successor were alive. Upon hearing these words, Hugo and Barrymore were shocked. As they both watched Vicar walk towards the door with their mouths agape, Hugo asked him what he was talking about. Vicar approached the office door and while looking at Hugo, he revealed to them that the successor of whom he was talking about was Miss Penelope's daughter. He also added that in other words, Hugo Le Baskerville had a granddaughter. At that moment, someone opened the door and entered Hugo's office. The person who had entered addressed Vicar as uncle, and upon seeing who this person was, Hugo was shocked. This person was Pomerian, who had been waiting at the door with Chihuahua. She grabbed Vicar by his clothes and told him that she had been waiting as he had asked her to. Upon seeing Hugo, Pomerian hugged Vicar's leg. Then Vicar revealed to Hugo that he had lied to him. He told him the truth by explaining that while he was in the forest, there was a girl he met in the Lakoko tribe region. She referred to the person who gave her the pendant that Hugo had in front of his eyes as mother. Upon knowing this, Hugo was shocked and while looking at Pomerian, he asked Vicar if by mother he meant his daughter Penelope. While he was holding the pendant and looking at Pomerian, he began to tremble. Upon seeing this, Vicar started to feel happy and wished for Hugo to be even more confused. While trembling, Hugo began to stand up. Vicar thought to himself that Pomerian was a girl whose blood was mixed with someone Hugo loved and something he despised. He approached Pomerian and began to look at her, creating tension in the atmosphere. Vicar started to wonder if the great Hugo would be able to remain calm in front of his granddaughter. Pomerian looked into Hugo's eyes and began to feel fear and tremble. With a murderous gaze and aura, Hugo asked Vicar if the fact that she was found in Lakoko meant that she was the daughter of his daughter and a barbarian. Vicar stared at him intently, with shining eyes, and replied that his assumption was correct. Upon hearing this, Hugo began to tremble with anger and despair. His pulse was shaking as he slowly reached his hand towards Pomerian's head. Vicar stared intensely at Hugo, savoring the moment, knowing that once he had been ruined, his revenge plan would begin. Several hours later, in the main house garden, Vicar and Osiris met up with Barrymore. When they saw what their eyes were witnessing, they were left in shock. In front of them was Pomerian sitting on Hugo's lap, she grabbed his beard, he asked her if it was funny to pull his beard. She smiled and addressed Hugo as her grandfather and replied that his beard was very dirty. Upon hearing the word grandfather from Pomerian's mouth, he asked her if she had really just called him grandfather. Vicar simply stood there looking without saying a word, but instead Osiris explained to them that even though he hadn't lived for a long time, this was the first time he had felt so surprised. Barrymore touched his glasses and told them that despite having lived for a long time, he shared the same thoughts as Vice Patriarch Osiris now. While Vicar was looking at Hugo and Pomerian, he began to wonder what was happening and why the Hugo he knew was suddenly changing. While Pomerian was eating a lollipop, Hugo put a hand on his face and started thinking that he was a grandfather. He couldn't help but cry at the thought that the day would come when they would call him grandfather. Seeing Hugo crying, Vicar became somewhat confused and surprised at the same time. He looked down at the floor and started sweating, and with a worried expression he began to wonder why Hugo Baskerville had that expression on his face. At the age of 15, after regressing, Vicar Van Baskerville went to Hugo's office and suddenly a thought occurred to him when he was in front of him. He began to wonder if Hugo Le Baskerville could be killed. 
but it didn't take long for him to come to the conclusion that the answer to this question was that killing Hugo was impossible. Those people who had reached the level of a sword master had an unbreakable mindset and spirit. Vicar had been looking for any opening in Hugo the times he had seen him, but he had been unable to find one, as Hugo didn't leave any openings even in his everyday life. And years after giving up on killing Hugo, Vicar met Pomerian, who grabbed him by the clothes and asked to go with him. Pomerian was Penelope's daughter, someone whom Hugo loved more than anyone else. There still existed a possibility that the emotional turmoil that would occur when he saw Pomerian could even shake the solid heart of the sword master. Beelzebub's skills, the sharp sword, and even Madame's poison made the probability of a successful murder increase gradually as time passed. Today was the day Vicar had planned to lay the groundwork for Hugo's assassination. But seeing him playing and smiling while with Pomerian, he didn't know what to do. While Vicar was watching this scene, his expression changed drastically as he didn't know why Hugo wasn't confused. A few hours ago, when he revealed to Hugo that Pomerian was Penelope's daughter, he approached her, and while extending his hand towards her, he asked Vicar if she was really Penelope's daughter. Vicar simply stayed enjoying the moment without saying a word, and little by little Hugo started to bring his hand closer to Pomerian's head, creating tension in the air. Just before Hugo's hand could reach her, she revealed that her mom's name was Penelope. Upon hearing these words coming out of Pomerian's mouth, Hugo was shocked. Pomerian took his hand with both hands and explained to him that her mother had always followed in the footsteps of her father and mother, and so she had also followed them guided by the necklace that her mother had given her. She slowly began to remember that Hugo was in the photo inside the necklace. She looked at him intently in the eyes and asked if he was her grandfather. Upon hearing these words, he started to remember the image of his daughter Penelope smiling. He was left speechless for several minutes, and then became enraged as he was unable to save his daughter from the clutches of the barbarians. He began to tremble and while crouching down, he loudly said Penelope's name. Vicar looked towards him and was shocked as he couldn't believe what his eyes were seeing. Instead of exploding with anger upon knowing that his own daughter had a child with a barbarian, Hugo closed his eyes and tears started falling like an endless river onto the ground. While Pomerian was holding one of his hands, Hugo put the other hand on the ground and fell to his knees, crying as he remembered his daughter Penelope again. Back in the present, while Vicar was lost in his thoughts, Barrymore caught his attention and thanked him. Upon hearing these words, he became confused because he didn't know why Barrymore was thanking him. While Pomerian was sitting on Hugo's lap, he looked at her and with a pleasant smile asked if she liked sweets. She was amazed to see the candies since she had never tasted them before and didn't know what they were. While Barrymore and Vicar were watching them, he explained to Vicar that he had never thought the patriarch could smile so happily. He also added that everything felt like a dream, as he was witnessing something he could have never imagined. While Vicar was staring at Hugo, Barrymore thanked him, leaving him even more confused than before. While Hugo was watching Pomerian eat a sweet, he closed his eyes and started smiling as he felt like he had found something that he had lost many years ago. Barrymore and Osiris also smiled as they felt a peace in their hearts, seeing that Hugo, a person who was never happy, was smiling in this way. Vicar clenched his fist and began to tremble not knowing the answer. Then he relaxed his fist, and while staring at Hugo intently, he realized that he was full of openings. But despite knowing this, he couldn't bring himself to do anything. He started wondering why he felt so helpless. As night fell, Vicar returned home and lay down on his bed, staring at the ceiling of his room. The sigh and with a lost gaze, he began to look at the ceiling and sank into his thoughts. After several seconds, he turned upside down and thought that the Hugo he remembered was very different from the Hugo he had seen today. Long ago, when he was captured and accused of treason, while two Baskerville men were holding him so that he wouldn't escape, Hugo appeared and Vicar looked into his eyes and explained that he was innocent. He also asked why he didn't listen to him. Instead of answering, Hugo remained silent, and upon seeing that he wasn't responding to his question, Vicar began shouting and asked if he was really doing this to blame him for all the sins of Baskerville. Hugo simply replied that he no longer wanted to hear anything more from a sinner. He also explained that according to the information he knew, his son Vicar not only had connections with demons but also kidnapped orphans' children and sacrificed them to the demons. Upon hearing this, Vicar became confused and told him that he never did such a thing. And just before he could finish speaking, Hugo drew his sword and in the blink of an eye cut off his tongue. While Vicar was covering his mouth to prevent bleeding, Hugo began to look at him with disdain while sheathing his sword, and ordered him not to address him with his wicked tongue. With a gaze and a murderous red aura, 
Hugo called him trash because the acts he had committed were unforgivable. While Victor was covering his mouth, he looked at Hugo with a murderous gaze and exploded in anger, swearing revenge. Hugo was the man who had condemned him to death for all the sins of Baskerville. While Victor was staring at the ceiling, he began to wonder why he was hesitating to seek revenge. While he was distracted, someone entered his room and asked what that lethargic face was about. Looking in the direction of the voice, he saw Cindy Wendy sitting on the windowsill of his room. While she was taking off her hood and mask, she looked at Vikir and asked him if he was waiting to put his arms around someone. She entered his room and took out an envelope, and while she was heading towards the bed where Vikir was, he asked her why she had come here. She got angry upon hearing this, and replied that she had come to bring him what he had asked for. She threw the envelope in Vikir's face and explained that the envelope contained what he had asked for. The investigation on Set La Baskerville. She sat next to him and asked why he seemed like he had lost the whole world. She also added that she was busy, so she was just going to inform him about what he had requested. Vicar simply stayed silent, listening. Seeing this, Cindy Wendy explained that as he himself had previously told her, she had been investigating Set La Baskerville in detail over the past few days. She explained to him that Set sponsored several orphanages under a false name, pretending to be the godfather and also taking care of the adoption of the children. While Vicar was reading the contents of the envelope, Cindy Wendy explained to him that Set had removed all information about the adoptive parents, and for this reason she had not been able to find out where the adopted children were. She also told him that if he really was a demon like he had told her, then the problem would be bigger. She stared at Vicar, who was reading the report contained in the envelope, and she explained to him that if a demon had kidnapped the children, the purpose was obvious. She revealed to him that the purpose was to use the children as offerings or food. She also added that she came to the conclusion that the disappearance of the children in Underdog could also be related to Set La Baskerville. Little by little, Vicar began to read the reports about Set, and after several minutes, he tightly grabbed hold of the report sheets and thought to himself that he was lost. Since this meant that the current Set was the evil one, and that the set he had served before regressing was also a demon, the person who had given him the information that Hugo was going to incriminate and execute him was none other than Set himself. One day while Vicar was sitting chained in his cell waiting to be executed, Set appeared and with his hand on his face explained to him that Hugo had named him responsible for all of Baskerville's sins, and due to this, his execution was not going to be stopped. Set had put his hand on his face to pretend to be sad, but in reality, he was very happy. With a smile, he told Vicar that he was very sad because there was nothing he could do to help him. After reading the reports, Vicar began to rage and with a murderous look, he thought that the person he had trusted the most was responsible for all his suffering. At the same time, in a forest, where an adult person holding a kerosene lantern and a child were walking, the child addressed the adult as sponsor and asked him where they were. The man holding the kerosene lantern revealed to the blonde-haired child that this would be his new home where he will live from now on. Upon hearing this, the child became confused and started to feel very scared. He looked to one side and while sweating, he told the man that the director had told him that he would be adopted into a good home. After several minutes, they arrived at a cave, and while the man was holding the kerosene lantern to light the way, he revealed to the child that this cave would be his new home. The person accompanying the blonde-haired child was none other than Setla Baskerville. He began staring fixedly at the child and with a smile told him that this must be a misunderstanding. Then he closed his eyes, and his face started breaking into pieces, causing the demon inside him to start emerging. He explained to the child that this cave was not going to be his new home. The demon opened its mouth and revealed to the child that from now on, he would live inside his mouth instead of the cave. Upon seeing the demon's appearance, and while the demon's drool was falling onto the child's head, he began to feel immense terror. This demon had an eye at the bottom of its stomach, and it also had thousands of teeth. The demon opened its mouth and started staring fixedly at the child. The child couldn't help but cry and think about his mother since he was unable to move. The demon slowly began devouring the child, leaving only his boots and a puddle of blood on the cave floor. After devouring the child, the demon transformed back into Set and with a smile thought that is expected, young humans were the most delicious. While the demon was staring at the cave ceiling, he put his hand on his eye and began licking the blood on his face with his tongue thinking that he couldn't stop devouring children. This demon disguised as Setla Baskerville was Andromalius, who belonged to the ten elite corpses of demons and possessed the tenth corpse. After devouring the child, the demon Andromalius returned to his cave, which was quite far from the city of Underdog, as he did not want anyone to find him while he was enjoying his meal. At the same time, moonlight began to penetrate into the cave through holes in the ceiling. 
Inside the cave, Demon Andromalius sat on his stone chair. Next to his chair was a small table made of stone and the floor was filled with remains of skeletons from children who had been devoured by him. On the stone table next to him, there was a black raven alongside a bottle of wine. While Andromalius held the red wine glass in one hand, he told the raven that it still wasn't enough. Then he placed his hand under his chin and began to gaze at the lake in front of him. Slowly, he brought the red wine glass closer to his mouth and explained to the raven that no matter how much he thought about it, human supply was not sufficient. He asked the raven if it would be better to raise humans like livestock and create an organization to devour children whenever he pleased. The raven that was on the stone table had three demonic eyes, and it was also a demon that had taken the body of the raven. Andromalius looked at the raven and addressed him as eight, asking for his opinion on raising humans. The demon disguised as a raven also belonged to the ten elite corpses of demons and possessed the eighth corpse, but the name of this demon was still a mystery. Eight noticed that Andromalius had only been eating children, so he asked him to be careful not to emit any odor since the Baskerville bloodhounds had a good sense of smell. Andromalius closed his eyes and put his hand behind his head. While holding the wine glass, he told Eight that this was annoying and also reassured him not to worry about it because he had already set a trap and no one could enter the cave. He slightly tilted his head towards Eight, and while holding the wine glass with one hand, he pointed at him with the other and explained that at this rate, in order to gather enough magical power to open the door, he would need to suck human blood for twelve and a half more years. Upon hearing this, Eight realized that Andromalius was still considering breeding humans, so he warned him not to stir up something that wasn't worth it among humans. He also asked if there was anything else going on inside Baskerville. Andromalius looked at Eight with one eye and replied that there wasn't, and added that he was doing fine. Then he asked Eight to make sure everything was okay with the morgues. Eight began to look aggressively at Andromalius and slowly started to dissolve his body. He told him not to worry and added that they, the ten elite corpses, only needed to focus on opening doors that would lead to the ruin. After all, they were the links between the human and demonic realms. Andromalius looked towards the table and saw that Eight's body turned into a black liquid. Just before disappearing completely, he explained to Andromalius that all of this was for the downfall of humans and the ten elite corpses. The black liquid began to spill over the edges of the table, and as Andromalius was watching it, he remembered Eight's words when he had asked if something was happening inside Baskerville. He brought the wine glass to his mouth to take a sip, and while looking at the floor, he thought that there was no way he could mention that Hugo had become an idiot because of his granddaughter. To weaken the Baskervilles, who represented a threat to the demon's plan, they needed Hugo to maintain his coldness. Andromalius needed to make sure that Hugo continued treating the young Baskervilles as perishable goods, so he wouldn't cause a commotion when he took them. After finishing his glass of wine, he stood up and moved away from his armchair. He thought that this wouldn't interfere with the plan, but still, he didn't know if it would work out. He put one hand in his pocket and with the other started touching his hair. While looking at the ceiling with a murderous gaze, he thought that Hugo had changed because of Vicar Van Baskerville's influence. He thought that annoying boy had survived when the venomous snake was released when he was younger. He had thought it was great when he died in the forest, but to his bad luck, he returned from the forest. And not only did he return alive but also brought Hugo's granddaughter with him. He began biting his thumb as he had done so much to destroy Hugo, and while biting his thumb, his demonic eyes started to shine as they were reflecting the inner rage he felt at this moment. Andromalius thought that his assumption had been correct and believed it would be good for the demons if he got rid of the problem once and for all. At the same time, in the main house, two people began to walk down the hallway. One of them was wearing an elegant white suit, while the other person was wearing an elegant black suit. The person wearing the white suit was Hugo, and the person wearing the black suit was Vicar. They both started walking together down the hallway, creating suspense in the atmosphere. Neither of them said a single word and simply continued walking. Seeing that Hugo wasn't saying anything, Vicar looked at him and thought that he had summoned him to talk, but they had been walking in silence for the past five minutes. Vicar began to wonder why Hugo had suddenly summoned him. Now that he was walking by his side, he realized that he was full of openings, and this was an opportunity that would not be repeated. He thought that this was the perfect opportunity to kill Hugo. Instead of taking advantage of this chance and seeking revenge against him, Vicar simply closed his eyes and thought that if it were him in the past, these would have been his feelings. But now he had completely different feelings. As he was immersed in his thoughts, Hugo caught his attention and told him that he was going to be honest with him. While they were walking, he closed his eyes and revealed to him that he knew he hated him. Upon hearing this, Vicar looked at him in astonishment and began to wonder what was happening. 
He quickly thought that Hugo had sensed his murderous intent. Hugo looked down at the ground with a sincere look and explained that he was a father who referred to his children as hounds and put them all in dangerous situations. He had always thought that his children despised him. Both stopped walking, and Hugo revealed to him that he had been cruel to him since he was young, even though he did everything right. He also added that the hatred his children felt towards him was a burden to bear. He also revealed that all of this was due to his revenge against the barbarians, and it was also his negligence in only knowing how to live by showing his own anger. Vicar looked at Hugo with eyes of surprise and thought there was no way Hugo could be speaking ill of himself, and quickly he thought that he was confessing and trying to test him. But to his surprise, Hugo Labaskerville himself apologized from the bottom of his heart. Hugo stood in front of him and while looking at the ground, thanked him. And upon hearing this, Vicar was speechless. While Hugo was looking at the ground with a lost gaze, he explained that Pomerian had told him that Penelope was happy until the end of her days. And his heavy heart was relieved a little to know that his daughter had not been unhappy during her final moments. He felt that by meeting Pomerian he had been saved. Hugo knelt before Vicar and thanked him for bringing Pomerian to him. As a form of gratitude, he allowed Vicar to obtain anything he desired, and also added that this was not a reward from Bloodhound but a gift of appreciation on his part. Upon seeing this, Vicar couldn't believe what was happening. Hugo, a person who only cared about himself, was expressing his heartfelt gratitude. After regressing, Vicar had a vague suspicion. A few years ago, when he was little, he went to Hugo's office, and when he turned around, Hugo asked him to do well in the midterm evaluation. Upon hearing these words, Vicar was speechless. With a sincere smile, Hugo looked at him and asked him not to lose against the direct bloodline. A few years later, while Vicar was fighting, Hugo appeared and ordered them to stop as it would be dangerous to continue. After a few years, while Vicar was recovering from his injuries, Hugo explained to him that in combat, being cautious would only lead to an injury. He also told him that this injury should become a lesson. After some time, Hugo addressed Vicar as his son and asked him not to do anything reckless. All these memories made a question come to Vicar's mind. He began to wonder if the Hugo in front of him was different from the Hugo he knew. He came to the conclusion that the cold Hugo no longer existed, and this was something strange that had happened after his regression. But because of this, he was even more confused. For the past 17 years, Vicar had only been thinking about his revenge but had always been able to forgive him. He realized that the person who had incriminated him was not Hugo, but the person who ordered his execution and did not trust him definitively was Hugo. While Vicar was looking at Hugo, who was crouched in front of him thanking him, he thought about the words revenge and forgiveness. He stared at Hugo intently and began to wonder which one he should choose first. Vicar addressed Hugo as the patriarch and asked him to please lift his head. Hugo listened to him and slowly began to lift his head. Vicar's thoughts at that moment were about finishing what he had to do. Once Hugo lifted his head, Vicar asked him if he could ask for anything as a reward. Hugo looked into his eyes and replied that of course he could. Upon hearing this, Vicar asked for what he wanted as a reward. And after asking him what he wanted as a reward, he thought to himself that he would decide later what to do with Hugo. At the same time, in the garden of the main house, someone was fixing Pomerian's hair. The man who was fixing her hair asked her if it wasn't great to be in Baskerville. Pomerian looked to one side and with a pleasant smile, she responded yes because her uncle Vicar, Grandpa Hugo, and Uncle Osiris were here. Not hearing his name, the man asked Pomerian what his name was. She looked at the man and while touching her cheek, she began to think. The person fixing her hair was Andromalius who was disguised as Set. Pomerian pointed at Andromalius and with a smile said that he was Uncle Set. While Andromalius was fixing Pomerian's hair, a maid appeared and with a smile asked Set why he hadn't started his isolated training yet. Andromalius looked towards the maid and with a smile replied that he wanted to see his niece before starting. The maid approached Andromalius, standing right behind him, and explained that the patriarch had told them that nobody should approach young Miss Pomerian. While Andromalius was fixing Pomerian's hair, he asked the maid to keep it a secret that he had been here, and he also asked Pomerian to keep it a secret. She smiled and replied yes. Andromalius took a strand of Pomerian's hair and complimented her on having beautiful hair. As he was looking at the strand, he closed his eyes and with a smile told her that her hair reminded him of his sister Penelope's hair. Upon hearing this, the maid was in shock and asked said if he had met Miss Penelope before. She also added that, to her knowledge, he hadn't been born then. Asking this question created tension in the air. After several seconds, Andromalius realized the mistake he had just made and thought that if someone were to find out about it, his true identity would be exposed. Set's head began to slowly open from the back 
and the demon Andromalius started to emerge. With the only eye that Andromalius had, he stared at the servant and told her that her father had been looking for her. The demon began extending its tentacles towards the maid and told her she should hurry and go see her father as soon as possible. While she was watching the tentacles approaching her, she was unable to move and was devoured by the demon. Palmyrian, upon seeing that Set had stopped fixing her hair, turned around and noticed that Set was alone and smiling. She asked him if Grandma had left. While the demon Andromalius was returning inside Set's body, he smiled and explained to Palmyrian that the maid had something urgent to attend to. He also asked her if she liked Grandpa Hugo. Upon hearing this question, Palmyrian looked at the ground and started blushing, replying yes. Andromalius revealed to her that he believed her grandfather really liked Palmyrian a lot. He started staring at her intensely with a demonic aura and told her that she really resembled Hugo's wife and his deceased daughter. She didn't pay much attention and kept playing, and little by little Andromalius began to bring his hand closer to her head, and the skin of his hand started to break, letting out the teeth of the demon. Both hands of Andromalius split in half, causing the demon to come out. Slowly, he began to bring his hands closer to Palmyrian's head and wondered how much Hugo would be destroyed by the death of his beloved granddaughter. While Palmyrian was distracted playing, Andromalius began to look at her with a demonic gaze and while his body was emitting a demonic aura, he started wondering how much Hugo would be destroyed by the death of his granddaughter. He began to bring his demonic hands closer to Palmyrian's head and little by little the skin on his hand started cracking revealing the sharp teeth of the demon that was controlling Set's body. He thought that no one would notice this since the only person who came to take care of Palmyrian in the garden was the maid who was already dead. But to his bad luck, a man wearing boots appeared and caught his attention. Upon hearing the man's voice, Andromalia's happy and demonic expression changed drastically to concern, as he thought he had been discovered. The man who had caught his attention was none other than Osiris. He approached him and while staring at him intently, asked where the maid was and what he was doing here. Osiris simply stared at him intently although deep down he knew that something had happened to him. Upon realizing that the voice belonged to Osiris, Andromalius couldn't help but feel anger as he had been so close to killing Pomerian. With a pleasant smile, Pomerian turned towards Osiris and greeted him. Andromalius also turned towards him, closed his eyes, and with a smile explained to him that the maid was not in the garden when he arrived. And since he saw Pomerian alone, he decided to stay and take care of her. Deep down, he didn't know if Osiris would believe this lie, but to his surprise, he believed it. While staring into his eyes, Osiris explained that Hugo would be very angry if he found out about this. So to avoid problems, he advised keeping it a secret from Hugo. Andromalius looked into his eyes and with a smile replied that it was a good idea. Osiris also advised him to return to his isolation training now. Upon hearing this, he closed his eyes and with a pleasant smile replied that he would start the training again next week. Deep down, he decided to kill Osiris someday as he was quite annoying. Osiris began staring into his eyes and remained silent for several minutes. Then he approached him and took hold of his arm. He looked into his eyes with a worrying look and explained that he was concerned that he was pushing himself too hard. He also added that if he needed help, then he could come and find him at any time. Andromalius looked at Osiris' hand touching his arm and was left speechless, as he couldn't believe what his eyes were seeing. Someone like him who only cared about himself, was worried about someone else. He clenched his teeth in anger and began to wonder if he really cared about him. He couldn't help but get angry when he thought that because of him, he was always being pressured by Hugo, since he was always comparing them to each other, and as Osiris was considered a genius. Every time Hugo compared them, he felt quite sad and began to wonder why he hadn't been born a genius like his brother. He thought that if Osiris had not existed, then Hugo would never have compared them. Osiris noticed that he was starting to get angry, so he got his attention and asked if he was okay. Upon realizing this, Andromalius put his hand on his face and while his eyes were shining, he thought that this was not good since the remaining memories of Set were coming to his mind. He asked Osiris to forgive him, then turned around and while looking at the ground, explained that now that his brother had come here to take care of Palmyrian, he would be leaving as he had important things to do. While he was walking away from them, Pomerian looked at him and remained with his mouth open. On the other hand Osiris simply stayed watching and didn't say a word. While Andromalius was walking away from them, Osiris started thinking and several seconds later, coughed to get his attention. Seeing this, Pomerian looked into Osiris' eyes and was somewhat surprised. Instead of stopping to listen to what he had to say, Andromalius simply kept walking. Upon seeing this, Osiris was quite surprised and with a sincere look, he explained to Pomerian that this was the first time he had ever cared about someone. 
as the son of the vice patriarch, it was a fact that Osiris had to be like him. That's how he had been taught. He had grown up watching his father's cold and heartless back. But on the day he saw his father start crying at the thought of being called grandfather someday, his thoughts changed drastically and he realized that if Hugo, the coldest person, could express his emotions, then so could he. Although deep down he didn't know if he would be able to continue living expressing these uncomfortable emotions that existed within him. He put his hand on Pomerian's head and thanked her, addressing her as his niece, and upon seeing this, she was speechless as she didn't know what was happening. While both were enjoying the views of the garden, he began to stroke her head and thanked her from the bottom of his heart because everything was changing thanks to her coming to Baskerville. Several days later, as night fell, Andromalius returned once again to his cave, where a chilling wind began to emerge from within. Inside, Andromalius sat in his stone chair. He began to tap the floor with the heel of his shoe because he was very nervous and didn't know how to face the situation. He crouched slightly and while biting his thumb, he stared fixedly at the ground. As he continued nervously tapping the floor with the heel of his shoe, he thought to himself that this was very annoying. Back at the Grand Palace, Hugo returned to his office with Barrymore, and while he was watching Pomerian eat a hamburger, he couldn't help but feel happy. Andromalius noticed that after that day, Hugo hadn't left Pomerian's side, and because he was in love with his granddaughter, he couldn't kill Pomerian. As he looked down at the ground, his eyes filled with anger as he thought that had been his chance. He thought that if the damn Osiris hadn't interfered, he would have been able to kill Pomerian, and thus bring back the cold Hugo. Every time this thought came back to Andromalius' mind, it made him even angrier. Little by little, he began to lose his composure and while touching his chin, he forcefully hit his back against the stone armchair. While looking at the floor with a lost gaze, he thought to himself that there was still plenty of time before the door opened, so there was no need to hurry. Quickly, he came to the conclusion that it could be more effective to kill Pomerian when she was more valuable to Hugo. And when that moment arrived, he began to question how he would end Pomerian's life. He started wondering if he should poison her just like he had done with Roxana and make it look like she died from an illness, or if he should use the barbarians just like he had done with Penelope. When thinking about all the ways in which he had made Hugo suffer, he couldn't help but feel joy again. With a smile and a demonic look, Andromalius decided to kill Pomerian in an even crueler way so that Hugo would suffer even more from the loss. While he was immersed in his thoughts and planning how to kill Pomerian, Vicar followed his tracks and arrived at the entrance of his cave. At first, he paused to think, and several seconds later, he unsheathed the Beelzebub sword and decided it was time to enter and ruin the demon's party who had taken over Set's body. Without hesitation for even a second, while his eyes were filled with rage, he gathered momentum and forcefully struck the trap created by Andromalius that was guarding the cave using the Beelzebub sword. Within seconds, the trap began to crack, and Andromalius didn't take long to realize this. The expression of happiness on his face changed drastically. Quickly, he grabbed the sword and stood up from the stone chair, while staring fixedly at the entrance of the cave. He realized that someone had made a crack in the trap. Several seconds later, he felt the presence of someone entering through the entrance and began to question who had been able to crack the trap created by the most powerful demons. From the dark entrance of the cave, slowly Vicar's figure began to become visible. Several seconds later, he entered inside and with a murderous look started staring intensely at Andromalius, creating tension in the atmosphere. While staring into his eyes, he put one hand in his pocket and extended the other hand towards the demon known as Set. He explained to him that, as promised, he had come here to pay him a little visit. Upon seeing this, Andromalius became confused and started feeling afraid when he realized that the person who had managed to crack the trap was none other than Vicar Van Baskerville. He asked Vicar how he knew he was here. Vicar extended his hand and explained that he had simply followed him all the way here. He also added that since Set hadn't noticed his presence at all because he was lost in his thoughts, it had been very easy for him to follow him to the cave. Vicar began activating the ability of the second slot called Silent Heal Mashusu of rank A+, plus, causing blood to slowly spread across his hand. Upon seeing this, Andromalius became nervous and started wondering how a simple mid-level graduate had been able to create a crack in his trap. He thought to himself that if Vicar had followed him into the cave, it meant he knew his true identity. While lost in his thoughts, Vicar caught his attention and while looking at the remains of skeletons of children who had been devoured by Andromalius, told him that his sudden visit had caused him many problems. He asked him what he had been doing in such a chaotic place. Upon hearing this, Andromalius also looked towards the remains of skeletons and thought that Vicar had not yet discovered his true identity. But to his bad luck, Vicar told him that it was as if Set were the demon behind the case of the missing children in the city of Underdog. 
Upon hearing this, Andromalius was speechless and several seconds later, he began to smile and thought that now that he knew his true identity, he couldn't let him leave alive. He decided not to continue hiding his identity, so he showed him his true nature, and while his body was emitting a dominic aura, he smiled and with a killer look asked him how he knew all this. Then he grabbed the tie and while he was pulling it off his neck, he asked him how he had discovered his identity. Vicar's body began to emit a murderous aura, and while staring into his eyes, he smiled and addressed Set as a demon, telling him that it seemed like he was no longer planning to hide. Andromalius took the sword in one hand and while unsheathing it, started approaching Vicar. With a demonic look in his eyes, he explained that it was no longer necessary for him to continue hiding his identity since there was no one else in the cave except the two of them. He took the sword with both hands and while unsheathing it, he mocked Vikir, telling him that he didn't know where he had gotten that confidence of his to come here alone and empty-handed. In the blink of an eye, he pounced on him and began enveloping his demonic mana in the sword. As he approached Vikir, he stared into his eyes with a murderous look and asked him with a smile if he was ready to lose his life. Andromalius aimed at Vikir's neck and in the blink of an eye, swung the sword with incredible speed and precision, attacking his neck. He couldn't help but smile as he stared into Vicar's eyes. He thought that now that Vicar was dead, no one would interfere in the demon's plans. But to his surprise, Vicar moved at inhuman speed and caught his attention, asking him why he was laughing. Upon hearing this, Andromalius looked to the side and saw a hand holding his sword, which was stuck in the ground. Seeing this, he became confused. Looking at his arm, he realized that he had cut off his hand. Vicar simply activated the Beelzebub sword and enjoyed the moment without saying a word. While Andromalius covered the wound on his hand with his other hand, he looked down at the ground and began to wonder when Vikir had pulled out a weapon. It didn't take long for him to realize that the pain he now felt was as if his soul had been severed. He came to the conclusion that the weapon Vikir had was Beelzebub, the Sword of Gluttony. He asked him how he had the relic of Grand King of Flies, the holy constellation of the ancient devil. While Vikir was enjoying watching Andromalius writhing in pain, his eyes began to shine and as the Beelzebub sword emitted a demonic aura, he told Set that as expected, demons were knowledgeable when it came to themselves. Then he corrected himself and addressed Set as one of the ten demons who had come to the human world in order to open the door to the demon world. Upon hearing this, Andromalius was shocked, and while covering the wound on his hand, he looked into Vicar's eyes and asked how he knew this information. At that moment, he carefully examined his body and quickly realized what was happening. He panicked and asked why the soul he possessed was different from the rest of the Baskervilles. While Vicar's body was emanating a demonic aura, Andromalius asked him why his young soul smelled like the blood of the demons. He stared into his eyes and asked if he had been to hell. Vicar simply watched as Andromalius writhed in pain and thought that he was the one who had framed him in his previous life. As if deceiving him by making him believe he was his savior hadn't been enough, he had also been the person who executed him in the end. He approached Set as a demon and asked him to wake up. When he looked into his eyes, Andromalius felt immense pressure. Vicar began to emit a demonic aura and with an evil smile, he told him to remove all thoughts from his head, as he was not going to let him die so comfortably. On a normal day like any other, while people were walking happily, this happiness did not last long. Before Vicar regressed, despair came to the peaceful world. The gates connecting the demon world and the human world appeared in the sky. This moment was remembered as the moment when the invasion of demons had begun. People called it the Fall. The ten high-ranking demons who descended first into the underworld were responsible for opening this gate. These demons were known as the Ten Elite Corpses. In Vicar's previous life, amidst a long and arduous war against the demons, he encountered one of the Ten Elite Corpses. While he was injured and leaning on his sword for support, he looked up and saw a demon appear on the cliff. The impact of the demon's appearance was devastating, as out of a total of 671 people who participated in the battles, 666 died, 5 survived, 4 were left unconscious, and only one survivor was able to see the demon. While the demon was approaching Vikir, he fell to his knees and as he stared into his eyes, his expression changed drastically as he began to feel terror. The reason why the demon had let him survive was simply a whim of the devil wanting to equalize the number of dead to 666. The demon turned around, and while his body emitted an evil aura, he spread his wings and left. The only thing Vicar remembered is that the overwhelming strength of the high-ranking demon from the ten elite corpses was pure destruction. While he was staring into Andromalius' eyes, he began to wonder who would have thought that he would come across one of those ten elite corpses approximately ten years earlier. 
As Andromalius covered the wound on his arm with his hand, he looked into Vicar's eyes and upon seeing his expression, he started to wonder what he was thinking. Looking to the side, he saw the remains of skeletons of children that had been devoured by the demon. Upon closer inspection, he noticed that some bones were still covered in blood. He began to wonder if these bones belonged to the young children that Andromalius had devoured. Upon seeing this scene, he couldn't help but get angry while his body emitted a murderous aura. He stared into Andromalius' eyes with a killer look. Slowly, he began to rise from the ground, placing his left hand on his chin and while staring into his eyes with a demonic gaze, he smiled and asked if he felt anger upon seeing the remains of the children. Andromalius showed him his hand. Several fingers of his hand began to transform into parts of the children that he had devoured. The pinky finger transformed into a child's mouth, the ring finger transformed into a nose, the middle finger transformed into hair, and the index finger transformed into skin. He asked Vicar not to worry as the children were alive and breathing inside his womb. He also added that he could revive them if he wished. He began reciting words in the language of demons, causing the bodies of the children to slowly emerge from his own body. At first, Vicar simply stared at Andromalius, trying to understand where he was going with this. The disfigured faces of the children appeared on Andromalius' body, and they started begging for help. Upon seeing this, he couldn't help but become enraged and using the Beelzebub sword, he cut off his only remaining arm. While Andromalius was watching as his sword approached, he was unable to do anything about it. He fell to the ground on his knees and began writhing in pain, as Beelzebub's sword had damaged his soul. Vicar looked at Andromalius and started enjoying how he was twisting in pain. Then he told him not to worry about the children since the dead cannot come back to life. Seeing that both of his hands had been cut off, Andromalius looked down at the ground with a worried expression and began screaming due to intense pain. At that moment, his body began to emit a demonic aura and the two hands he had lost regenerated. He stared into Vicar's eyes and with a smug smile, explained that the regeneration had been completed. Andromalius stood up from the ground and while looking down, started dusting off his pants. He told Vicar that he understood that they both had many hidden things. Vicar simply remained silent and didn't say a word. Then Andromalius called him a genius, since even Osiris had only managed to reach the level of graduate at 30 years old, and he had achieved this at the young age of only 17 years old. It was clear to Andromalius that he had become an unparalleled irregular. Andromalius extended his hand to the side, causing it to slowly start changing shape. He thought that now that Vicar had the Beelzebub sword, the sword of the Lord of Demons, it was likely that he would become a future risk factor for demons. Several seconds later, his hand transformed into a sharp sword. He pointed it towards Vicar and while staring him in the eyes, he smiled and revealed that he was going to kill him here and now. Upon hearing this, Vicar unsheathed the Beelzebub sword. While looking at him with a murderous gaze, he promised to kill him to avenge all the children he had devoured. The two stared into each other's eyes for several seconds, creating tension in the air. Then the battle began and they both started attacking each other using their swords. Vicar stared Andromalius in the eyes and started attacking with the Beelzebub sword. But to his surprise, Andromalius effortlessly blocked all of his attacks. With a diabolical smile, Andromalius began to counterattack, but Vicar was able to block all the attacks effortlessly. He stared into his eyes and with a smile thought that Vicar's second name was Van and his own was luck, so there was a significant difference in power between them. The rule where collateral line and legitimate children could only learn up to the fourth technique. He attacked Vicar causing him to step back due to the difference in strength. He thought to himself that he couldn't defeat someone like him who was capable of using the sixth technique. Andromalius used the sixth Baskerville technique and launched a barrage of cuts. Little by little the attacks began to advance towards him. At first, Vicar simply stood there watching, but several seconds later, while his eyes were shining, he used the sixth Baskerville technique and was able to block all the attacks. Seeing this, Andromalius was dumbfounded and started wondering how Vicar knew about the existence of the sixth Baskerville technique. He smiled as he expected Vicar to have something else hidden. At that moment, part of his face began to transform into a flexible and sharp sword. While staring into his eyes, he smiled and used both swords to attack him by surprise. He blocked the sword attack from Andromalia's hand using the Beelzebub sword, but slowly the flexible sword started getting closer to his eye. With a murderous look, he glanced at the sword, and at that moment, the blade of the Beelzebub sword began emitting intense mana. 
Upon seeing this, Andromalia's happy expression drastically changed to surprise. The mana that the sword was releasing was so intense that it even made his hair start to fly. Vicar used the 7th Baskerville technique and counterattacked with a powerful strike against Andromalius, causing his sword to break in half and fly backwards. Vicar's attack hit him in the abdomen, causing him to start bleeding from the mouth. He began to wonder how someone like Vicar could know the 7th Baskerville technique, a technique that only the head of the Baskerville family was allowed to use. Vicar gained momentum and started advancing towards him at high speed. He stared into Andromalius' eyes with a murderous look while Beelzebub's sword emitted an intense aura. He attacked Andromalius in the abdomen using the sword. This attack was so powerful that it even created a large curtain of smoke inside the cave. Several seconds later, the curtain of smoke began to disappear, and it could be seen how Vicar had stabbed the Beelzebub's sword into the demon's chest. While he was writhing in pain, Vicar told him that demons always thought they were superior and looked down on humans. He approached and while looking into his eyes, smiled and mocked him by revealing that there was nothing easier to deceive than a cunning demon. Andromalius looked into his eyes and clenched his teeth tightly, as he couldn't believe that a mere human was mocking a demon like him in this way. The heroes who had closed the door and put an end to the era of destruction. In the end, they hadn't been able to find the ten superior corpses to condemn them completely, but now it was different because the fall had not yet begun. He was in an era where the ten elite corpses were still preserving their power and didn't want to show it to humans. Vicar approached Andromalius' ear and revealed that he had already understood everything. Upon hearing this, he became quite confused as he didn't know what Vicar was talking about. Andromalius became somewhat confused and looked at Vicar with eyes of surprise. He explained to him that the plan of the demon disguised as set was to connect the human world and the demon world, which meant that if he ruined the plan by killing the ten demons the fall would never come. Vicar's body began to emit intense mana. He stared into his eyes and with a murderous look, he told him that if he killed the ten demons, then his heart would feel somewhat relieved. Upon hearing this, Andromalius' expression changed drastically to fear. He started wondering why he felt afraid of a simple human. When thinking about this, he clenched his teeth tightly and started getting angry, and at that moment, he called Vicar a cursed human and his body began to emit a demonic aura. Vicar realized that something bad was going to happen, so without thinking twice, he moved away from the demon. At that moment, Andromalius' body transformed into a red ball made of blood covered in thorns. Vicar moved several meters away and abruptly stopped using his hand. While staring intently at Andromalius, he began to wonder what those thorns made of blood were. Little by little, the thorns started getting smaller until finally several seconds later, the legs of the demon Andromalius became visible. He asked Vicar who would have thought that Andromalius would show his true form in front of a human. Vicar simply stared and didn't say a single word. Several seconds later, the blood made ball disappeared and Andromalius appeared in his true demon form. He had two horns, sharp teeth, sharp claws, and goat legs. With a diabolical smile, he stared into Vicar's eyes and revealed that this was his true body. He extended his hand and admitted that his strength had been quite surprising to him. Vicar simply listened and didn't say a single word. At that moment, Andromalius extended his hand towards him and all the fingers of his hand transformed into devilish snakes. Little by little, the snakes began to advance towards Vicar. At first, he stood still for several seconds, but then he used Baskerville's seventh technique and with the Beelzebub sword, in the blink of an eye, he cut off the heads of several snakes that were being controlled by the demon. Although he had lost several snakes, Andromalius was not willing to give up. So with a diabolical smile, he extended his other hand towards Vicar, causing more snakes to appear and start advancing towards him. The snakes attacked him again, but he once again used the seventh technique and in a flash dodged their attacks and cut off their heads. While he was busy dodging the attacks, a snake appeared from behind and started moving towards him at great speed. Vicar was unable to sense the presence of the snake, and in the blink of an eye, the snake bit him hard on the shoulder. Feeling the pain, he quickly turned around and using the Beelzebub sword, cut off the snake's head. At that moment, Demon Andromalius began to smile and stopped attacking with snakes. Then he stared into his eyes and while having one hand resting on his waist, extended the other hand and revealed to him that the battle had already ended. Upon hearing this, Vicar touched the part of his shoulder where the snake had bitten him and asked Andromalius what he was talking about since a wound like this meant nothing to him. The demon Andromalius opened the palm of his hand and as he emitted an evil aura, a demon's mouth appeared in the middle of his palm. He used infinite blood absorption, causing Vicar's blood to slowly flow out of his body through the fang wounds inflicted by the snake. 
Victor became quite confused as he didn't know what was happening. Andromalius extended his hand towards him, causing the demon's mouth to start sucking all the blood that was coming out of Vicar's body. He approached his hand to his head, and while with the other hand he was sucking Vicar's blood, he looked at him intently in the eyes and with a smile revealed to him that his ability allowed him to control blood. He also added that his abilities were absolutely invincible when fighting against living beings. While Vicar's blood was shooting out of his shoulder, he simply stood there with a murderous look. At that moment, Andromalius revealed to him that all the blood from his body was going to spill out, leaving him dry. He was the tenth corpse called Andromalius. His risk level was S+, plus. the size was unknown. The discovery location was deep within the Gate of Destruction, known as the Snake's Womb. The alias of this demon was the Tenth Corpse, a natural enemy of humanity, one of the ten disasters known as incomprehensible and impossible to kill. The demon Andromalius reached out his hand towards Vicar, and slowly the demon's mouth began to extract blood from Vicar through the snake fang's wound. While he was extracting blood from Vicar, he started staring into his eyes and with a smile revealed that he had the power to suck blood infinitely. He also added that the power he possessed was the power of immortality. He also added that as long as there were injured living beings around him, his vitality would be infinite. Vicar simply looked the demon in the eyes and didn't say a single word. Then he slightly turned his head to the side and began staring as his blood started shooting out from his shoulder through the snake's fang wound. At first, he remained silent, but several seconds later, he smiled. Seeing Vicar smiling, Andromalius asked if he had lost composure. He thought that he was mocking him, so he moved his hand even closer to him and started extracting the blood at an even faster speed. With a penetrating gaze, Vicar looked into his eyes, and while his body emitted a murderous aura, he covered his mouth with his hand. At that moment, Andromalius felt immense pressure, and Vicar revealed to him that it was amusing to see him enjoy something he didn't even know he was absorbing. Vicar's blood slowly began to take effect in Andromalius' body, causing him to gradually poison himself. He looked at Vicar with eyes of surprise and confusion as he didn't know what was happening. In a matter of seconds, he fell to his knees, placed both hands on the ground, bowed his head, and while agonizing due to intense pain, he asked Vicar if his blood was not the blood of an ordinary person. Vicar activated the Beelzebub sword, slightly turned his head towards the sword and while staring at the blade intently, smiled and asked Andromalius if he wanted to see something amusing. He brought the Beelzebub sword closer to his other hand and using the sharp blade made a deep cut on his wrist, causing his blood to slowly trickle down like a waterfall onto the ground. While Andromalius was writhing in pain, he heard the sound of Vicar's blood. He slightly raised his head and upon seeing that Vicar's blood was emitting a demonic aura, he quickly realized that the blood in Vicar's body was not ordinary blood but poisonous blood. Seeing Andromalius' expression, Vicar revealed to him that he not only possessed toxic blood. In a matter of seconds, the wound he had made on his wrist using the Beelzebub sword completely healed. He began to stare into Andromalius' eyes and with a smile, revealed to him that like demons, he could also use regeneration. Upon hearing this, Andromalius' expression drastically changed as he stared fixedly at the wound on Vicar's wrist. He began to sweat and wonder how it was possible for a mere human to possess the ability of regeneration. He also started to question how Vicar's blood could harm demons. Only the mountain spider, the nine-headed serpent that lived in the land of giants, and the great Medusa beneath the Black Sea possessed this terrible venom. Gradually, drops of Vicar's toxic blood began to fall onto Andromalius' face. He clenched his teeth tightly and while looking into his eyes, he began to wonder how it was possible that the blood of a mere human could contain a poison on par with the most powerful monsters. Vicar made a small cut on his finger using the Beelzebub sword, then extended his finger towards Andromalius causing the blood to slowly drip onto his face. Within seconds, the toxic blood started taking effect, causing the demon to experience intense pain. Andromalius placed his head on the ground and while covering his face, he began to scream due to the intense pain caused by Vicar's toxic blood. He simply stared at him fixedly, and upon seeing how he was writhing in pain, he couldn't help but smile. He mocked Andromalius and asked if he wanted some more blood. Vicar possessed the gluttonous fly known as Beelzebub. In the first slot he had equipped Madam's deadly poison ability of S rank. In the second slot, he had equipped the Silent Hill Mushu Hushu ability, which was rank A+. Plus. And in the third slot, he had equipped the Super Regeneration ability Swamp Salamander of Wolf, which was rank A+. Plus. He put his finger in his mouth to stop the bleeding, 
Then he stared at Andromalius who was writhing in pain on the floor and thought that as expected, Madam's poison was even effective against the ten elite corpses. Thicker unsheathed the Beelzebub sword, and while the blade was emitting a strong aura, he thought that he wouldn't be able to kill Andromalius using only Madam poison. Slowly, he began to advance towards Andromalius and thought that now he had confirmed that the poison was effective. He was a high-ranking graduate in 6th Baskerville, and now that he possessed the power of Beelzebub, he thought he would be able to defeat the 10 elite corpses of this era. Vicar unsheathed the Beelzebub sword, activated Baskerville's 7th technique, and attacked Andromalius in the chest, causing a deep cut. After receiving the attack, Andromalius fell to the ground and while writhing in pain, he stared fixedly at Vicar who was approaching him. He clenched his teeth tightly and began to wonder why Vicar's strength was incomprehensible for a demon like him. Several seconds later, Vicar approached Andromalius and as his body emitted an intense and murderous aura, he stared directly into his eyes. Andromalius began to wonder how on earth a monster like Vicar had been created. He decided not to dwell on the matter any longer and concluded that for now, the most important thing was to stay alive and let the demons know of his existence. He deactivated the shield that was protecting the cave, and it didn't take long for Vicar to notice. He slightly turned his head towards the cave's exit and realized that the demon had gathered more magical power. While he was distracted, Andromalius slowly started standing up while his body was emanating a demonic aura. With a demonic smile, he decided to turn the water into blood. He used his demonic power and slowly, the water from the river that flowed through the cave began to float and gather behind Vikir. As the water slowly gathered behind him, he simply put his hand in his pants pocket and watched without saying a word. Gradually, the water started transforming into blood. Realizing this, Vikir slightly turned his head back and while watching as the water was turning into blood, he thought that Andromalius even had the power to turn water into blood. He also thought that despite not being able to use all his power now, a high-ranking demon was still a high-ranking demon after all. Using the Beelzebub sword, Vicar cut his wrist and then extended his hand towards the river, causing the toxic blood to slowly drip into the water. He stared into Andromalius' eyes and told him that now that he had poured his toxic blood into the river, he wouldn't be able to absorb the water. While Andromalius was standing up and his body was emitting a demonic ore, he looked down at the ground and responded to him that if he was trying to prevent him from being able to absorb the blood by spraying his own toxic blood into the river, it was useless. While the drops of blood that Andromalius was controlling with his power were floating around them, he revealed to Vicar that turning water into blood served no purpose such as absorbing the blood. Upon hearing this, Vicar became cautious and simply remained silent without uttering a single word. Andromalius put a hand on his face and while staring fixedly at the ground, gave the order to the blood knights to stand up. At that moment, the drops of blood that were floating around and in a gaseous state transformed into liquid state and began to fall towards the ground. Once the drops of blood impacted against the ground, they transformed into blood knights. In a matter of seconds, many blood knights appeared and surrounded Vikir. He simply stood still and made no movement. Andromalius stood up and while covering the wound on his face with his hand, he stared into Vicar's eyes and revealed to him that these blood knights could use the sixth technique of the Baskervilles, which he himself had learned. He also added that even if he could use the seventh technique, he would not be able to go against all the blood knights who could use the sixth technique. With a fierce look, Andromalius stared into Vicar's eyes and while his eyes reflected the anger he felt at this moment, he revealed to him that he was going to kill him and then kill everyone he loved one by one so that he would regret going against the ten elite corpses. The blood knights adopted offensive poses and slowly began to approach Vicar. He simply looked at the blood knights, put his hand in his pants pocket, and didn't say a single word. He started taking his hand out of his pocket and asked Andromalius if these blood clots could really use all the Baskerville 6 technique. He thought this was going to be dangerous since he hadn't prepared for this situation at all. A few days ago, when Hugo had offered Vicar anything he wanted as a reward, he had chosen something specific. He took out a whistle from his pocket and while holding it in his hand, he started staring at it intently. Then he showed the whistle to Andromalius and remembering that he had lived in Baskerville, asked if he knew about this whistle. Upon seeing the whistle, Andromalius began to get nervous and quickly took several steps back as he knew what the function of that whistle was. He opened his eyes and upon thinking about what Vicar had planned to do, he started sweating. Vicar simply put the whistle in his mouth and while staring at him with a murderous look in his eyes, smiled. 
He took a deep breath and using all his strength blew into the whistle. Within seconds, the sound wave began to travel through the cave until several seconds later it exited the cave and reached the forest. Upon hearing the sound of the whistle, a man with long hair appeared and began to stare fixedly at the mountain of Andromalius Cave. The man placed both hands on his sword and slowly began to unsheathe it. At the same time, inside the cave, Andromalius pointed his finger at Vikir and ordered the Blood Knights to quickly finish him off, knowing that something bad was about to happen now that he had used that whistle. The Blood Knights followed Andromalius' order and slowly began to advance towards Vikir. Vikir didn't even attempt to defend himself from the attack of the Blood Knights. He stared directly into Andromalius' eyes and revealed that the whistle had the power to use Baskerville's commands. The Blood Knights gained momentum and gradually started advancing quickly towards Vikir, who simply stood still and revealed to Andromalius that the Black Whistle had another function. While all the Blood Knights were advancing quickly towards Vikir, the silhouette of a cut appeared on the cave wall. He stared into Andromalius' eyes and revealed to him that the other function of the whistle was to allow him to use Baskerville's full force. At that moment, someone unleashed a powerful cut against the mountain where Andromalius' cave was located. This cut was so strong that it even split the mountain in half. Because the mountain had been split in half, a strong wind entered inside the cave, causing debris to start flying. Andromalius covered his face with both hands and while staring intently at Vikir, he began to wonder what was happening. At that moment, the Baskerville hounds appeared and started unsheathing their swords. All the hounds used their swords and quickly entered the cave. Andromalius looked up and was left speechless as he couldn't believe what his eyes were seeing. Due to the powerful attack, half of the mountain had disappeared as if it had never existed. Someone wearing boots appeared on top of the cave and began to wonder why Vikir had asked him to borrow the power to control all Baskerville. This person was none other than Hugo Le Baskerville. He hadn't come alone but Osiris Le Baskerville, and Boston Terrier Le Baskerville had also come with him. Hugo placed both hands behind his back and while staring intently at Vikir, he thought that the reason why he had asked him to borrow the power to control all Baskerville was to hunt a demon. He began to stare at Andromalius with a murderous look and told everyone that he expected nothing less from his son. Upon hearing these words, Vikir felt honored. He placed a hand on his chest, closed his eyes, and slightly bowed his head to thank his father for the kind words. Andromalius stepped back several meters from him and while looking into his eyes, he was in shock. He looked up and upon seeing Hugo Le Baskerville, the commanders, and the vice patriarch Osiris, he began to tremble with fear as he didn't know how he was going to face all these monsters. In front of him, all the Baskerville hounds appeared, and upon seeing this, he started wondering why they were all here. Hugo extended his hand to one side and caught everyone's attention. For the next six hours, he hereby declared that Vicar Van Baskerville, the possessor of the whistle, had full control over their entire force. Vicar simply lowered his head slightly and closed his eyes, then he lifted it up and while staring at Andromalius with a murderous look, he ordered all the Baskerville hounds to tear the demon into pieces. At that moment, one of the Baskerville hounds appeared behind the demon Andromalius and stabbed him in the chest. Upon hearing Vicar's order, all the Baskerville hounds gained momentum and began thrusting their swords into Andromalius' body, who started writhing in pain. All the Baskerville hounds unsheathed their swords, gained momentum, and began stabbing Andromalius in the neck. Due to the intense damage they were causing him, he started writhing in pain. Vikir, Hugo, and the others simply stood silently watching as he revealed to them all that this demon disguised as Set had the power to restore magical power absorbed through blood. Gradually, the blood in the river began to heat up. Upon seeing this, Vikir asked the Baskerville hounds to immerse themselves in the poison river for those who were injured. Little by little, more Baskerville hounds gained momentum and began to advance quickly towards Andromalius, and he explained to them that this way they would not be helping the demon. He called the attention of all the Baskerville hunting hounds, extended his hand to one side, and while staring fiercely at Andromalius, he gave them the order not to get hurt. Upon hearing this, all the hounds became furious, gained momentum, and with a deadly look started advancing quickly towards Andromalius. At the same time, at the top of the cliff where Hugo and the others were, while Boston Terrier was looking at Vikir. He put his hands in his pockets, smiled, and told his brothers that Vikir had instantly lifted the spirits of the hounds. While Great Ladane was looking at Vikir, he put his hands behind his back and with a smile explained to his brothers that he didn't know that his beloved nephew was so good at commanding. While they were talking, Hugo simply placed his hands behind his back and remained silent. 
Then, while staring intently at Andromalius, he explained to them that he hadn't been able to realize that his own son had become a demon. He asked his brothers if this was the current reality of Baskerville. At the same time, while Andromalius had the swords of the Baskerville hounds stuck in his body, he cursed them all. Then he extended his hands to the sides, causing his fingers to transform into snakes. Gradually, the snakes began to move towards the hounds and started attacking them. For his bad luck, due to the fact that the bloodhounds outnumbered him, in the blink of an eye, they began cutting off the heads of the snakes. Then, they gained momentum and attacked Andromalius again, thrusting their swords into his body once more, causing him to writhe in pain. As the snake heads were gradually falling to the ground, Andromalius thought that everyone was facing him without backing down, even knowing how dangerous the abilities of a high-ranking demon like him were. He didn't take long to realize that these were the Baskerville hunting dogs, and he thought that their ability went beyond his own imagination. He quickly started turning his head to one side, thinking that even though he used healing abilities, he would only be wasting his own magical power. Therefore, he quickly decided to find a way out of this situation. As Andromalius's eyes slowly closed, he stared intently at Osiris, who had a hand resting on the sword. He thought that Osiris was the key. He asked Vicar and Hugo to make a deal. Upon hearing this, he started staring into his eyes and began wondering what the demon had planned now. The Baskerville hounds put Andromalius on his knees, grabbed him by the arms, and placed two swords near his neck. He stared directly into Vicar's eyes and explained that if he spared his life, then he would leave Set's body right away. He also asked if he planned on abandoning the second son of the family so easily. At first, Vicar began to stare at the ground and asked him what he was talking about. Then, with a murderous look in his eyes, he stared back at him and asked if he really believed that Baskerville would accept that negotiation. Upon hearing this, Andromalius' expression changed drastically. He clenched his teeth tightly and while staring directly into Vicar's eyes, he thought that he was right because he himself knew that this proposal would not succeed with them. However, he knew that in this place there was only one person capable of accepting the proposal. While the Baskerville's hounds were pointing their swords at his neck, he gazed fixedly towards the top of the mountain and called for Osiris. He asked him if he was going to let his younger brother, who had followed him all this time, die. Osiris simply placed his hand on the sword and remained silent, listening. Andromalius thought that if his prediction was correct, then Osiris was the kindest person in Baskerville. He thought that if he could penetrate his mind well enough, there was still a chance of being saved. He stared into Osiris' eyes and with a smile, he told him that this was going to be the last chance to retrieve Set. Upon hearing this, he began to think, and several seconds later, gaining momentum, he descended towards the ground, right behind Vicar. Slowly, he started walking towards Andromalius creating tension in the atmosphere. Meanwhile, while Vicar was staring intently into Andromalius' eyes he advised Osiris not to be deceived as the demon was lying. He simply kept walking and after taking several steps, he stopped near the demon. While the Baskerville hounds had Andromalius held by his arms, Osiris began to stare into his eyes. The demon simply lowered his head down and Osiris explained to him that if the soul of his beloved brother Set still remained in his body, then as the older brother it was his responsibility to save him. He asked the demon if there was still anything he could do for his younger brother. Upon hearing this, Andromalius's expression slowly began to change. While looking down at the ground, he started to smile as he couldn't believe that his plan was working. At that moment, he transformed his face into Set's. He lifted his head, placed a hand on his chest, and while looking into Osiris' eyes with a sad gaze, he addressed him as his older brother and explained that he was still alive. Andromalius started to cry. He begged for forgiveness and explained that he had sold his soul to the demon. He also added that the years of being compared to his older brother and constantly evaluated by Hugo had been very difficult moments for him because he had been very weak. Hugo began to stare at Andromalius and simply remained silent, not saying a single word. He also explained to them that he truly regretted selling his soul to a demon. He also admitted that all the commotion that had been caused so far was his fault. With tears in his eyes, he asked Osiris to give him a chance to atone for his sins. Just before he could finish speaking, Osiris unsheathed his sword and in the blink of an eye, cut off the demon's head with a precise strike. While staring down at the ground with a sad expression, he explained to Set that this was the only thing he could do for him, so there was no need to regret anything. Andromalius's head fell to the ground, creating tension in the atmosphere. Within seconds, a pool of blood formed around his head. 
With his last bit of strength, he looked to the side and began to wonder why his plan hadn't worked. Osiris closed his eyes, sheathed his sword, and as he was walking, passed by Vikir. Vikir looked into Osiris's eyes and asked him not to blame himself since Set's soul had already been extinguished. He also revealed to him that what they had been hearing so far was actually the demon who had been acting upon Set's soul. With a sad and lost look, Osiris looked down at the ground and explained to Vikir that all of this had been his fault for giving the demon an excuse to approach Set. He thought that when he was young, if only he had taken better care of Set, none of this would have happened. While both were looking at the remains of the children's skeletons that had been devoured by the demon, Osiris explained that it was still too early to mourn the corruption and death of one of their brothers. He thought it was sad that the children who were going to become the future of the Baskerville territory had ended up being mere sacrifices. He told everyone that as the head of a small household, he was ashamed not to have been aware of this situation until now. Upon hearing this, Vicar began to stare at the ground and thought that his older brother was right. While both were looking towards the lake, Osiris explained to Vicar that he didn't even know he was playing into the hands of the demon. At that moment, one of the hounds looked up and caught the attention of the others. Looking up, Vicar and Osiris saw how slowly Andromalia's head began to fly away and escape. Wings like those of a bat had grown on Andromalia's head. While he was flying, he looked at Osiris and Vikir and with a smile called them stupid hounds. Then he looked into Hugo's eyes, and with a smile, he revealed to everyone that the opening of the door could be delayed, so there was nothing they could do about it. He also added that the other demons, who were his brothers, would open the door. He also added that he would come back to kill them all as soon as he recovered. Vikir quickly turned towards the demon, clenched both fists tightly, and while watching him fly away, gritted his teeth and thought that he had no way to attack from this distance. Osiris also turned his body towards Andromalius and while looking him in the eyes, he simply remained silent and didn't say a single word. At that moment, Hugo caught Set's attention and reminded him that he himself had taught him that swordsmen should not turn their backs. He slightly turned his head towards the demon and while giving him a murderous look in the eyes, he addressed him as dear son. Upon hearing this, Andromalius turned his head towards Hugo and upon seeing his murderous gaze, began to feel immense terror. While he was looking at Andromalius with a murderous gaze and his body was emitting intense mana, little by little he began to unsheathe the sword. Seeing this, the demon Andromalius began to wonder what this feeling was. He thought that Set must have completely disappeared. He also started to wonder why Set's fear of Hugo still persisted in his mind. While Hugo was looking at him with a murderous gaze, smoke started coming out of his mouth. At that moment, Andromalius realized that this sensation was pure fear of the strong. While Hugo's body was emanating intense and powerful mana, he unsheathed his sword, causing everyone in Baskerville to feel its incredible power. Vikir and Osiris simply looked at Hugo and remained silent. Hugo assumed an offensive stance and aimed for the head of the demon Andromalius, who was flying away. At that moment, Andromalius remembered something. While the moon's rays were piercing through the clouds, he turned his head towards Hugo and as he looked into his eyes, he smiled and explained to him that it didn't matter if he was a master swordsman, as there was no way his sword strikes could reach the sky. In the blink of an eye, Hugo unleashed a powerful strike towards the demon. These strikes were so powerful that they even cut parts of the mountain into pieces. Just before demon Andromalius could finish speaking, Hugo's attack severed his head into pieces, leaving him confused. Little by little, the pieces of his head began to fall to the ground and as they turned into dust, he started wondering how it was possible for a mere human to be so powerful. Hugo simply started looking at the sky and remained silent without saying a word. Vicar stared at Hugo intently and thought that this was the power of swordsman Hugo LeBaskerville. Hugo's attack had been so powerful that it even cut the clouds into pieces. In a matter of seconds the demon's head disappeared, leaving only the light of the moon. As the fragments of dust that were part of Andromalia's head slowly fell to the ground, Vicar thought that this was the power of swordsmanship shown by a master swordsman. This is the end of the video, if you guys want to see the next part, then don't forget to subscribe and like the video.